In 2019, U.S. media accused China of bullying in the South China Sea due to its giant terraforming operations to create artificial islands. One of the major consequences of these islands being built up, according to the press, is the possibility of an all-out war with the USA. That's not how China explains things, nor does it admit things could presently be going wrong with these islands. As you'll see in the video today, China might have a major problem on its hands which could turn into a supremely expensive catastrophic failure. Before we get to those failures, we should explain exactly what these terraforming operations are and what they might mean for countries in the region and for all of the US. We'll finish the video with our thoughts on how useful those islands would be in a war with the US. Let's start off with Fiery Cross Reef, said to be China's biggest land reclamation project in the South China Sea. China claims the island, part of the Spratly Islands, for itself, but so does Taiwan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Before 2014, there really wasn't much going on at Fiery Cross Reef, but now it looks like a place that would be useful in a war. As you can see on any map, the area is surrounded by many nations. China claims much of the region as its own, which includes the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands, and also other places such as Pratis Island, the Verrecker Banks, the Macclesfield Bank, and the Scarborough Shoal. China places a nine-dash line around the areas it thinks it controls. But where did China get the idea that everything within this nine-dash line was part of its territory? Who gets to make such decisions when so many countries are nearby? The most powerful country might be China's answer, but its rivals would certainly disagree. China was the world's superpower for centuries. If you look at the history of global GDPs, China and India were both much richer than the other powers in the year 1000. It's believed together their GDPs made up about 50% of the world's total GDP. In the year 1600, that share was 51.4% of global GDP, with China being about 29% and India around 22. From around 1700 to the late 1800s, China was easily number one. Depending on which historian you ask, sometimes these values are slightly different, but no one disagrees that China and India led the world in terms of money. China called Europe a backwater for centuries, when much of Europe really was a backwater compared to the highly advanced civilization of China. This is one reason why China can confidently talk about its ancient maps and records that show various dynasties, including the Song, Yuan, and Ming dynasties, which were in control of the South China Sea. An official Chinese statement to the EU in 2016 said, According to Chinese ancient texts as far back as the Han dynasties, China had large-scale activities of ocean navigation, trade, and fishing, with the South China Sea being the major ground of China's maritime activity at the time. It goes on to say that China discovered these islands, the islets, the reefs, and the shoals, and other countries, and the EU might disagree, nonetheless it explains China's claims. Before China's so-called 100 years of humiliation said to have begun in 1839, China's economy was six times bigger than that of the superpower Great Britain and 20 times bigger than the fledgling USA's. But all this changed, and it changed relatively quickly. During this period, much of China's territories were lost. Due to many factors including China's isolationism, as well as a failure to properly modernize its military and corruption within the Qing dynasty, China experienced a century of military losses. With them, it lost much of its territory. The British kicked this all off with the first opium war between 1839 and 1842. That's when China lost Hong Kong. In the second opium war, 1856 to 1860, the French joined the Brits in beating up China. This was not a good time for China, as it signed what it now calls a series of unequal treaties. The French and the English even looted China's summer palace during this phase in China's history, which even the West now admits was very much out of order. This period was certainly a humiliation for the advanced nation of China, which some scholars say is a reason for its sometimes aggressive attitude. The words never again are now a part of China's political rhetoric. In the Sino-French War of 1884 to 1885, China ceded influence in North Vietnam to the French. Later, after the First Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895, China lost control in Taiwan when Taiwan fell under Japanese colonial rule. The Qing Dynasty of China had previously annexed Taiwan in 1683. As you know, Japan was defeated in World War II, and then after that, China reclaimed territories, including the areas we're talking about today. In 1949, the Chinese nationalists were defeated by Mao Zedong's communists. The nationalists escaped to Taiwan, but importantly, they still claimed the South China Sea. Prior to leaving it, it was this regime who drawn the territory map, an 11 dash line around the South China Sea. That's why Taiwan still claims to own this territory, but the PRC doesn't see it this way. The reason the line was reduced to nine dashes was because of a treaty between Communist China and Vietnam. 
The history is a lot more complicated than this, but let's just say this entire area is heavily disputed by a handful of countries. Given its history, China doesn't think there's anything to dispute. Nonetheless, China and Taiwan claim the region for themselves, while other countries only claim parts of the region. For example, in 2009, China said China had indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters. Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Brunei disagreed and Taiwan definitely disagreed. It's Vietnam and the Philippines who seem really against China's claims. Over the years, Vietnam has created 49 outposts across 27 different features in the Spratly Islands. The Philippines has built 9 outposts, but none of these nations have done the kind of building China has. As you'll see at the end, the Philippines has just taken a big step toward ensuring China doesn't try to take any more reefs or islets or islands in the region. Such disagreements might make more sense when you understand that about 3.37 trillion US dollars worth of global trade passes through the South China Sea every year. That's about a third of the total trade in the entire world. Almost 40% of China's trade passes through the South China Sea, as does about 80% of its energy imports. Close to 14% of all US maritime trade passes through the area. If this trade corridor was ever blocked, it would cause mayhem in the US, as it would elsewhere. It said around 30% of all global crude travels through the South China Sea. So do about half of the world's fishing vessels. Then you have the rights to fishing there and all the natural resources, including crude oil and natural gas. About $11 billion worth of oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So, if a great big war were to break out, having control of this region would be a strategic feather in your cap. That's one reason why it really matters who the USA takes sides with in the disputes over these territories. Obviously, not China, despite China certainly having a strong claim. Still, other countries also have a strong claim. It should also be said that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea has invalidated China's nine-dash line claim. Also in 2016, an international tribunal said China had violated international law by building those artificial islands. Ok, so back to Fiery Cross Reef. We hope after hearing what we just told you, you understand why this 677-acre bit of land is so darned important. The Philippines, Vietnam, and Taiwan might claim the place, but it's China doing the construction there, and there's not much the other countries can do to stop it. The process of reclamation involves dredging sand, soil, and rocks with large dredging vessels from close to the reef. The materials are taken to the site, where they're laid down to create a surface. This space is compacted, and more heavy machinery reshapes and levels the place until the topography is just right. Once the land was raised at Fiery Cross, Chinese workers laid down the concrete and constructed the infrastructure and buildings. This includes an airstrip, aircraft hangars, communication facilities, radar installations, accommodation, port facilities, and various administrative buildings. The island is protected with coastal defense structures. In such a wild place, coastal erosion is more than possible. Creating bits of land in the sea and hoping it'll stay solid is quite ambitious, and maybe even a little foolhardy, not to mention expensive. No one knows exactly what China spent just on Fiery Cross, but it's estimated that it was around $12 billion. And that was years ago, as you'll see later, the upkeep might prove to be a very big expense. In 2014, China stationed about 200 soldiers on Fiery Cross. In 2016, after the 3,125 meter long airstrip had been built, it started landing civilian and military aircraft there, including a military transport aircraft. It was subsequently reported that anti-aircraft weapons appeared on the island as well as a missile defense system. There were also early warning radar sites on the island. This was reported after China had said it had no intention of militarizing the place. It didn't look that way to outsiders. The US State Department soon issued a statement saying there was a pressing need for claimants to publicly commit to the reciprocal halt to further land reclamation, construction of new facilities, and militarization of disputed features. China's artificial islands soon became known as the Great Wall of Sand. While much of the rest of the world is talking about these islands being something close to stationary aircraft carriers or fortresses in the sea, China keeps playing down the fact that they're military installations, while they certainly look like military bases. China has a good reason to want to keep this area secure. It makes sense in a world dominated by power politics, especially in this era where people talk about the balance of power shifting from US hegemony, unipolarity, to a global power balance, bipolarity or multipolarity. China might not want to get into a war with the US and its many allies, but it certainly will want to defend one of the most important strategic areas in the entire world. Still, China won't admit that. 
It has just said it's improving the working and living conditions of people stationed on these islands, or that the islands are for fishing assistance, weather reports, offering shelter, or helping out distressed ships that pass by. Nonetheless, the Western media has pointed out many times that missile defense systems aren't generally required for protecting fishermen. Not all the islands look exactly like military bases, but many do, such as the Gavin Reefs, also claimed by Vietnam, Taiwan, and the Philippines. At just 210 acres, we're talking about a tiny place, about the size of 119 British soccer pitches, if we take those professional pitches as being 1.76 acres. It's now home to anti-aircraft guns and a missile defense system, so again, not exactly fisherman friendly. The aptly named Mischief Reef at 1,380 acres is a much bigger project east of the Spratly Islands. Yet again, when China first started bringing in heavy machinery, some countries asked what China was doing there. It lies just 135 miles off the coast of the Philippines, Palawan Island. When the Philippines asked what China was doing, China said it was a fisherman's shelter. It now looks very much like a military base. The Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies released satellite images showing large anti-aircraft guns and probable close-in weapon systems. That said, China is arguably only doing what other nations would do in this world of balance of power politics. China has also built a 2644-meter runway there. The country at least admitted this when it later said the weapons were placed there for freedom of navigation. The Philippines has said this is about one thing and one thing only – conflict or possible conflict. An international tribunal later ruled that it and other nearby reefs were low-tide elevations that do not generate entitlement to a territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, or continental shelf, and are not features that are capable of appropriation by occupation or otherwise. In short, these reefs are not for building military bases, and since they're not classed as a nation's actual territory, the U.S. doesn't have to legally make a so-called innocent passage past the islands because in terms of international law, there are no islands to speak of. China made something out of nothing. You can see China's progress through a series of satellite images taken over the years, which amounted to turning almost nothing into something. It's a similar story with Subi Reef. Once a piece of wild reef, now a developed bit of land with a military base, a harbor, and a landing strip about 3,000 meters long. Some of these islands are home to laser and jamming equipment. Fighter jets could land there. There's absolutely nothing about the island that screams fisherman's shelter. In the past, when the U.S. Navy reconnaissance aircraft have flown through the area, they've been warned that they've strayed into China's airspace. One of those radio messages said China has sovereignty over the Spratly Islands, as well as surrounding maritime areas. Stay away immediately to avoid misjudgment. The pilot shot back, well not literally, I am a sovereign immune United States naval aircraft conducting lawful military activities beyond the national airspace of any coastal state. Exercising these rights is guaranteed by international law, and I am operating with due regard to the rights and duties of all states. It's on these missions that U.S. aircraft have seen that these islands are a bit more than places where fishermen can put their feet up for a few hours. Images show harbors that can take at least 40 military vessels. They expose runways big enough for bombers and enough weapons to turn disputes into something ugly. A U.S. Navy spokesperson said they threaten all nations who operate in the vicinity and all the international sea and airspace. That's the reason for sojourns through the area, what the U.S. calls freedom of operation missions. These operations, phonops, are what the U.S. call operational challenges against excessive maritime claims, whereby the U.S. demonstrates its resistance to excessive maritime claims. China is no fan of phonops, once calling a particular operation a serious infringement on China's sovereignty. It's not only the U.S. that conducts them. In recent years, Japan, the U.K., Australia, and France have all launched phone ops, to which China usually invokes words such as escalation and provocation. But critics of this Chinese mission in the South China Sea have said the escalation started when China started building the islands. In all, there are seven reclaimed pieces of land with a total area of 5.2 square miles. It might not sound like much when you put it that way, but you can get a lot of weapons and runways in that amount of space. Also, to put these great chunks of concrete in the sea, China's had to upset the local ecology. At Mischief Reef alone, which is about six miles long, China had to bury the original natural reef under millions of tons of sand and gravel. For all the islands, we're talking about many, many millions of tons of sand and coral that had to be dredged and dumped. When China started building these islands, people not overly concerned about military strategies and war warned that there was a good chance that these fake islands could wash back into the sea. 
which in short would make life for marine animals and plants very hard. You have oil and chemicals and all sorts of dirt that could form clouds of matter that the sea doesn't need. One professor argued that all we've really heard about is military threats and the environmental threat has largely been ignored. He told the media, the worst thing anyone can do to a coral reef is to bury it under tons of sand and gravel. There are global security concerns associated with the damage, it's likely broad enough to reduce fish stocks in the world's most fish-dependent region. On top of this, Taiwan is saying China is stealing its sand, so Taiwan had to ramp up its Coast Guard efforts. Some say China's done this as a warning, and also to ensure not as much money is spent on Taiwan's military. In 2020, the Taiwanese military cracked down on 4,000 Chinese sand dredgers and sand transporting vessels, which was a 560% increase from 2019. The country says these operations are wrecking not only local ecology, but also undersea internet cables. So, we have islands by the sea that by international law should not be there. They've been built on unstable ground, and as you know, this ground could erode and wash back into the sea. There might be no way of stopping this. China might be a technological powerhouse, but nature always has a way of saying, keep out. Reports have stated that on some of these islands, concrete is crumbling, which means the very foundations of these islands could wither away and what stands on them could collapse. This is reportedly happening not because of any freak weather, just because the islands are in such an unforgiving area. Matters could be made much worse if a typhoon hits. There's also tectonic activity that could easily shift their foundations, while natural erosion could also cause the subsidence of these islands. There's also a natural process called sediment consolidation. This means the material that was laid down can become more compact, and when that happens, the entire island could move downwards, aka sink. These islands are so low that global warming also presents a threat. If the sea level rises, it might swallow the islands. It's said the global average sea level has been rising at an average rate of about 0.07 to 0.14 inches per year over the last century, but global warming might accelerate this. It's not certain what will happen, but low-lying islands are certainly within earshot of danger. In fact, it is possible that within decades, some of China's artificial islands could be totally swallowed up by the sea. That's if war hasn't finished them off long before that. The islands might well be sinking, and if they are, they could end up being huge wastes of money. Being so far away from the Chinese mainland, they aren't exactly easy to maintain in terms of structural problems. But even if they're not sinking, you have to ask what use they would be in a war. If it ever came to that, the US would likely strike at the three main islands with ballistic missiles, using electromagnetic warfare technology to get past the island's air defense systems. The US might also just form a blockade and starve the islands of food, weapons, or other materials. This would be quite a task given China's navy now is big or bigger than the US navy, although it doesn't have the same combat experience or missile strength. The main islands can hold a few fighter planes, likely 24 for each island, or even a bomber or two, but in the large scheme of things, a stationary target is a lot easier to hit. That's why one military analyst asked, are they a military asset or a liability for Beijing? There's no doubt that if war did happen, the US Navy can neutralize these islands with cruise missiles. One analyst believes it would take 30 to 50 cruise missiles for every one of the biggest outposts. As the aerial photographs show, the critical infrastructure on these islands is lumped together. It would not be hard to hit something important, while penetrating munitions would cause damage to structures that seems are already eroding. The US Air Force could send in strategic bombers armed with cruise missiles sent from a number of bases. China might have enough aircraft shelters for its fighter aircraft, but with one runway, it would soon start to look congested down there, and any strike would quickly make that runway unusable. With US submarines, you also have supply issues for China. China does have enhanced anti-submarine warfare capabilities, meaning US submarines still pose a problem. This could be one reason why China has invested so much in submarines as of late. China's islands have rightly been called a challenge to enemies of the regime, but in the event of war, it's hard to see China being able to keep them. They certainly are a substantial presence in the region, but more so to smaller nations. The US could deal with them, we think. The US has seen its fair share of military failures over the years. The US would suffer greatly in the effort of trying to destroy them, there's no doubt about that. That is, if China can save them from sinking or falling apart before that happens, which we imagine will become a very costly venture for China. It seems the country is willing to spend the money, having reportedly just built the world's largest suction dredger that is 50% more powerful than the so-called super dredger used previously. The old one was 6,017 gross tons and had a dredging capacity of 4,500 meters cubed per hour that was said to be the largest in Asia, so the new one is something special. 
What does this mean? Well, for one thing, it seems China is certainly getting ready to do some more dredging. That's why the government in Manila believes that China might move on to other islands in the region. It's the reason, or one of the reasons, why after 30 years, the Philippines is opening up its doors again to a U.S. military presence. U.S. troops will have access to four new military bases there. As China digs, the U.S. is setting up shop, just like it did during the Cold War. How this ends is anyone's guess. Hour Zero the war begins with an alarm at the 2nd Space Warning Squadron in the heart of Buckley Space Force Base in Colorado. Tens of thousands of miles above the Earth, the United States' space-based infrared system keeps a careful eye on the Earth, with a string of satellites in geostationary orbit around the planet. From this ultimate high ground, their unblinking electronic eyes monitor the planet's surface for infrared events. The satellites are supplemented by a constellation of surveillance platforms in lower orbits and networked together to track, identify, and report on any significant infrared event anywhere in the world. Originally, the network was operated by the Air Force and designed to detect nuclear tests conducted by the Soviet Union and other foreign nations. Then it was upgraded to provide early warning for ICBM launches. The massive heat plumes from the big intercontinental missiles are easily spotted, even from tens of thousands of miles above the Earth and through thick cloud cover. Now the system is so sensitive that it's able to track anti-ship missiles launched by the Houthi rebels in Yemen, and on January 7, 2020, proved its worth when it gave early warning to U.S. forces in Iraq as they were targeted by dozens of missiles fired from Iran in retaliation for the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Not a single U.S. service member was killed in the massive attack thanks to the advanced warning. War between China and the United States starts on a similar note, only on a much more massive scale. Tensions with China have been building for years as the nation becomes increasingly more assertive and determined to upend the US-led liberal world order. China seeks to recreate the world in its own image, and works to spread authoritarianism and suppress democracy around the world. Much like the Soviet Union in its early days, China believes that the survival of its ruling Chinese Communist Party relies on the spreading of its ideology around the world and beating back the influence of liberal democracies from its own borders. But China cannot be a major global power until it breaks U.S. influence in the Pacific, putting America and China on an inevitable collision course. At the moment, China is fully contained by the First Island Chain, a chain of islands stretching from Japan to Taiwan and the Philippines. The First Island Chain has contained communist nations since the Cold War. Any Chinese fleet sailing past this chain is under threat of attack from all sides, and China cannot secure its own vital trade shipping without breaking containment. The easiest way to break the chain is to invade Taiwan, which is already a priority goal for the CCP. This has made war between China and the U.S. seem all but inevitable. But before it can launch a successful cross-strait invasion, China must beat back the mighty U.S. Navy from the South Pacific. For this task, it's created the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, an entire branch of the military dedicated to long-range missile warfare. With an arsenal of thousands of ballistic and anti-ship missiles, the PLARF is the greatest threat the U.S. Navy has faced in its entire history, and on the eve of war, it's the first to strike. All across the heartland of China, hundreds of missiles lift to the sky. Some are launched from silos. These are larger, long-range ballistic missiles, which will target U.S. bases as far away as Guam. Hawaii is within range as well, but the decision to strike Hawaii or not is a political one fraught with great risks. Not only would it be a direct attack on a U.S. state, but it threatens to galvanize the American people as many would consider it a second Pearl Harbor. China's hope is that it can knock the U.S. out of the war in a massive preemptive strike, inflicting enough damage to the U.S. military hardware to render its Pacific Forces combat ineffective and killing enough U.S. service members to discourage an American public China believes doesn't have the stomach for a painful extended war in the Pacific. Ultimately, it's decided that Hawaii is to be included in the attack. China has built up its own forces for a cross-strait invasion for months, sending a very clear signal to the world of its intentions. This has given the U.S. plenty of time to disperse its forces, pulling back many of its ships and aircraft to Hawaii and out of range of all but the longest-range Chinese missiles. To not attack Hawaii would leave a significant amount of U.S. firepower intact and even harder to target as it disperses once more upon entering the theater. Likewise, the decision to attack U.S. bases in South Korea, Japan, and the Philippines is a difficult one for China. Attacking these bases means inevitably causing collateral damage to the host countries and risks dragging them into the war. However, not attacking these bases leaves most of America's Pacific combat power intact and able to retaliate with ease from Pacific airfields and ports. Ultimately, the choice is a pragmatic one. China is already bearing the weight of hefty pre-war sanctions meant to deter it from its course. It must win this war, and win it fast, and that means neutralizing all U.S. combat power, no matter where it is based. 
U.S. space surveillance satellites immediately spot the infrared signature of hundreds of ballistic missiles lifting to the sky. In less than two seconds after detection, the alarm is already blaring at U.S. Space Force's second space warning squadron. After a very quick verification that this is not an error, a priority flash alert is dispatched to the President of the United States, combatant commanders, and U.S. installations and ships around the world. China has timed a cyber operation against the U.S. military network simultaneously with its massive attack, but it's unable to defeat the multi-redundancy global alerting system used by the American military without physically blowing satellites out of orbit. The greatest concern is that some of these missiles could be nuclear in nature, and there is simply no way to tell until impact. The Department of Defense does not believe that China would launch a nuclear attack without significant provocation or unless the CCP found itself in a life-or-death scenario. But U.S. nuclear forces are put on their highest alert anyway. Space Force supercomputers, however, have calculated the trajectory of the Chinese threats and none appear to be en route to the U.S. homeland, as would be the case in a nuclear attack. The White House bets on a conventional attack. At installations and ships across the Pacific, U.S. missile defenses get to work. Spy radars track the ballistic threats as Aegis computers work on a firing solution. Fleet air defenses spit out volleys of SM-3 missiles to intercept the incoming anti-ship ballistic missiles as they enter their terminal trajectories. On land, Patriot air defense batteries fire their own interceptors. Japanese self-defense forces add their own interceptors to the volleys racing up to the sky to meet the incoming threats. One by one, Chinese missiles are blown out of the sky, but China's anti-ship missile inventory is massive, and it has more than enough missiles to saturate the defenses of every U.S. vessel in its Pacific fleet. Hitting a moving target thousands of miles away, however, is not easy, so to improve their odds, U.S. ships begin erratic maneuvers. Its nuclear-powered aircraft carriers are leaving the rest of the fleet in the dust. Despite being the largest combat vessels in the world, the U.S. Navy's nuclear carrier fleet is capable of putting on bursts of speed at classified velocities. Movement complicates Chinese firing solutions, and some of the anti-ship missiles are off course as they re-enter the atmosphere and weather the volley of SM-3s. U.S. electronic attack against Chinese satellites is also complicating guidance, and some of the missiles who survive the hail of missile defenses smash into the ocean harmlessly. Many don't, however, using both satellite navigation and active radar guidance. Chinese DF-21s, dubbed carrier killers, pack a 600-kilogram conventional warhead. Over 1,300 pounds of high explosives smash into the deck of the USS Carl Vinson and Theodore Roosevelt, penetrating into the lower flight deck before detonating. The explosion is catastrophic, destroying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of aircraft and equipment. Even a near miss is enough to seriously damage the aft of a U.S. supercarrier, and in a flash, America's naval air power is almost completely knocked out of the war. At port facilities and airfields across the Pacific, Chinese missiles rain down and saturate air defenses, destroying aircraft on runways and inside soft shelters. Fuel and maintenance facilities are a priority target, but it's difficult to do much damage to fuel systems buried deep underground. Runways are cratered across the Pacific, but most of the damage can be repaired within hours by skilled crews. The worst of the damage will only knock an airfield out for a day or two at most. The damage to parked U.S. Air Force, Marines, and Navy aircraft, though, is significant. Having pulled back a significant amount of aircraft to Australia and Hawaii has limited the damage, but hundreds of U.S. and Allied aircraft are nonetheless damaged or destroyed. The missile attacks even extend all the way to joint U.S.-Australian air bases along the north coast of the continent. Inevitably, there is collateral damage. Multiple missiles stray off course and smash into civilian targets. Hundreds of Japanese, South Korean, and Filipino civilians are killed, along with scores of service members. China has, in effect, declared war on the entire U.S. Pacific Alliance system, but the nation has no choice. If it's to win the Pacific, it has to deny the U.S. the ability to operate close to Taiwan battle space, and that means dragging its allies and partners into the conflict. Day 2 the Chinese invasion of Taiwan is underway. A fleet of a thousand ships, most of them smaller civilian vessels, has been assembled over the last three months and has been crossing the 100 miles between mainland China and Taiwan. The same missile assault that devastated U.S. forces in the Pacific laid waste to Taiwanese infrastructure as well. Military targets and airfields across the country came under attack from thousands of shorter-range missiles. It's the biggest missile attack in human history. But while Taiwan has suffered significant losses, it's been prepared for such an attack. The majority of its air force is safely secured inside hardened aircraft shelters and mountain tunnels. The airfields are devastated, but they can and will be quickly repaired. Already, Taiwanese F-16s are engaging in long-range, beyond-visual-range battles with their Chinese counterparts. 
The advantage in the air is decisively China's. Not only does it vastly outnumber Taiwan, but it's operating from airfields across the Chinese mainland that are out of reach from Taiwanese missile attack. Taiwan's sortie rates, meanwhile, are abysmal until the damaged airfields are repaired and aircraft are moved to stretches of highway to serve as impromptu runways. China, however, runs into the same problem that Russia did in its air war against Ukraine. Its lack of combat experience makes it difficult for it to de-conflict the airspace over and around Taiwan. Friendly fire incidents from destroyers across the Taiwan Strait downing Chinese jets are disturbingly common. During Desert Storm, the US-led coalition was able to deconflict the airspace over Iraq despite 4,000 operational combat air platforms at the time, resulting in only a small handful of blue-on-blue -blue incidents. But the US military trains aggressively and in conjunction with its various military branches. China has only recently unified its military under a single joint command and has only been running realistic training scenarios for a few years. The Chinese military is green and it's paying the price for it. The amount of air power China can bring to bear over Taiwan is significant, but limited by its ability to keep its air defense network from blowing friendlies out of the sky or being vulnerable to enemy attack. This creates opportunities for Taiwan's beleaguered defenders. The cross-strait invasion fleet runs into a veritable wall of anti-ship missiles. Taiwan has been armed with hundreds of American-made Harpoon anti-ship missiles, which can be fired from F-16s or from ground-based launchers. The Harpoon is an old missile by modern standards and quickly being replaced in the US military with a newer generation of anti-ship weapons, but it's still capable, especially so in large numbers. Its 488-pound warhead may not pack the punch of more modern 1,000-pound warheads, but it's more than enough to seriously damage or even cripple a medium-sized ship. The sky is full of Chinese anti-missile defenses, with missile interceptors flying out to smack harpoons out of the sky and sea whiz systems filling the air with tungsten. Inevitably, though, a significant number of these missiles punch through China's air defenses and wreak havoc on the invading fleet. Adding to the number of harpoons is volleys of Xiangfeng 2 and 3 missiles launched from mobile platforms. This helps them evade the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force's precision preparatory bombardment. The carnage is vast, but so too is China's numbers. Inevitably, its troops make landfall on one of the just over a dozen beaches suitable for the invasion. However, Taiwan has booby-trapped the beaches with all manner of defenses. Upon approaching, landing craft suddenly find the ocean around them on fire as pipes release oil into the ocean and set it on fire. Hundreds of Chinese marines are incinerated in the landing craft. But once they hit the beach, they find boards with razor-sharp pieces of metal attached to them just under the sand. As the Chinese Marines hit the deck to crawl forward under a hail of enemy fire, their flesh is ripped apart. Then there's the landmines, thousands of them. Chinese aircraft and ships have attempted to blast safe paths through the vast minefields, stretching nearly 100 meters from the shore to the Taiwanese positions, but US-supplied artillery shells can redeposit fresh minefields from a distance. Each shell carries up to nine anti-vehicle mines, or many more smaller mines, and can create vast minefields with just a few volleys. That is, when the Chinese Marines aren't being shelled with anti-personnel high-explosive shells. The beaches have been sighted in. Defending artillery just needs to fire as quickly as it can reload. Chinese attack helicopters attempt to knock the artillery set up deep behind the beaches, but are greeted by swarms of manned portable air defense missiles. Incoming Chinese ships also have to navigate a massive minefield deployed by Taiwan in the weeks leading up to the invasion. The strait has not been safe for civilian traffic since the minefields were deployed, and China has attempted to use minesweepers to clear the strait. But these ships are easy prey for anti-ship harpoons. Safe lanes through the floating mines are carved out with a combination of brute force and what minesweepers survive in their efforts. Chinese casualties are apocalyptic. It takes the concentrated might of the PLARF and the Chinese Air Force to blast the Taiwanese defenses apart so the amphibious assault can push out of the beaches. Even then, half of the assaults fail. Where they succeed, fresh Chinese troops must disembark only to wade their way through scores of their fallen comrades. D-Day pales in comparison. This isn't war. This is a slaughter. Day 3 China's problems have been compounded significantly with the arrival of US air power. American carriers have been at arm's length, with the use of ballistic missiles and H-6 bombers armed with standoff anti-ship missiles. However, a flight of H-6 attempting to perform a follow-up attack against Taiwan were pounced on by US F-35s flying out of the Philippines, resulting in the loss of 16 bombers. The US Air Force has recovered faster than expected from the PLARF's missile barrage, mostly by widely dispersing prior to the war and then by quickly converting civilian airfields and host nations to military ones. China's plans to use H-6s to keep the US US Navy at bay is cancelled for the time being. The PLARF still has hundreds of missiles left, but they are a quickly diminishing resource and one that cannot be easily replenished. 
Neither can American air power, but the US has nearly twice as many combat aircraft as China, and they are overwhelmingly more modern than their Chinese counterparts. It'll take weeks to rotate the bulk of its firepower to the Pacific and repair destroyed logistics chains, but the US and Japan are able to start air operations against China by the third day of the war, if on a limited scale. Rather than try to fight for the sky over Taiwan, U.S. aircraft launch standoff weapons at Chinese vessels in the strait and those attempting to isolate the island by blockading it from the north and south. A new weapon enters the war, one that's being fielded for the first time, the U.S.'s Long Range Anti-Ship Missile or LRASM. This intelligent stealthy missile can fly unguided to a target zone and then use artificial intelligence to choose its own target, ignoring civilian vessels and remaining undetected for far longer than its non-stealthy counterparts. It's not invisible to the radar, but it does allow the LRASM to get much closer before Chinese defenses attempt to intercept it, greatly increasing its survivability. Featuring a 1,000-pound blast fragmentation warhead, LRASMs aren't just twice as survivable as harpoons, they pack twice the punch against Chinese ships, and China is facing a significant amount of them. The US has deployed the LRASM not just on F-15s, F-18s, and F-35s, but on a completely new and revolutionary platform codenamed Rapid Dragon. The concept is stunningly simple, but proved tricky to get right. Taking advantage of America's huge air mobility fleet, Rapid Dragon consists of stacks of missiles and airdroppable modules that are simply shoved out the back of transport aircraft. With up to 45 missiles per drop, Rapid Dragon utilizes C-130 and C-17 cargo planes, normally slow, vulnerable, and unarmed transports, to deliver cruise missiles against both land and naval targets at ranges of up to 570 miles. C-130 aircraft only need 3,000 feet of runway space to take off from, which has made it impossible for China to shut down every airfield in the Pacific that the aircraft could fly from. With two Rapid Dragon pallets each, for a total of 12 JASSM missiles, the US is able to completely overwhelm China's air defenses from well outside the range of even its air force. C-17s flying from airfields as far away as the US homeland link up with aerial tankers to refuel and approach the Taiwan battle space. Each C-17 can carry five pallets of nine JASSM missiles, and some of the pallets contain drone decoys instead of missiles. Other missile variants include sea mines, which scatter a wide area with deadly sea mines that wreak havoc on Chinese shipping. American submarines, meanwhile, have been making a meal of Chinese ships and attack submarines alike. China's submarine fleet is notoriously noisy, and only its newest subs are comparably silent. But these are still in low numbers. American attack subs first focus on eliminating the undersea threat, but many quickly transition to attacking Chinese surface vessels. With an average depth of 50 meters, the Taiwan Strait is too shallow for a submarine to safely operate in without being detected. But U.S. submarines have been equipped with long-range anti-ship missiles, which can be fired from their torpedo tubes. This allows them to engage surface vessels from well outside the strait, and the deep waters immediately off the eastern Taiwanese coast means they can get close enough to launch cruise missile strikes against Chinese forces landing on the island. America's silent service, a threat overlooked by even U.S. analysts, is quickly proving to be its deadliest weapon against China. While the U.S. Navy's surface fleet still can't approach Taiwan due to the anti-ship threat, China's anti-submarine warfare capabilities are notoriously poor, and U.S. submarines are notoriously good at their job. Week 2 the air war over Taiwan has been joined in earnest at last, with US and allied forces having weathered the Chinese missile storm. America's air fleets outnumber China's by two to one, but a significant amount of its Pacific air power was destroyed on the ground or knocked out of commission in the opening hours of the surprise missile attack. Requests by the Air Force for hardened shelters in vulnerable airfields such as Guam have gone largely ignored by US Congress for over a decade, and its aircraft have paid the toll. But the US is able to bring in aircraft from other theaters, and Japan and Australia have both thrown in their air forces to the fight. South Korea has decided to engage targets of opportunity as they arise and provide security for US tankers flying in its airspace, but its air force needs to be prepared for a possible attack by North Korea. There is a significant fear of North Korea exploiting the chaos to launch an attack to the south, effectively tying up large amounts of South Korean resources. Allied aircraft are on the whole better equipped and its pilots better trained than their People Liberation Army Air Force counterparts. But China has one significant advantage over the Allies, the PL-15, outranging American AIM-120s by as much as 10 miles. The PL-15 air-to-air -air missile is a deadly threat to Allied aircraft and gives Chinese fighters the ability to engage American, Australian, and Japanese aircraft well before they are able to. 
but the PL-15 can't hold F-35s and F-22s under the same threat. It's unknown at what ranges Chinese aircraft can detect and target U.S. stealth aircraft, but it's estimated to be at only two dozen or so miles, allowing F-22s and F-35s to fire well before the Chinese fighters even realize they're there. However, China has its own stealth fighter, the J-20, or more accurately, a low observable fighter, as the J-20's stealth capabilities are significantly worse than that of its American counterparts. But this still allows J-20s to seriously threaten fourth-generation aircraft, such as the F-15, 16, and F-18s. And when equipped with the PL-15, makes them a deadly threat to anything but stealth aircraft. China has an estimated 200 of these aircraft, and it knows that it must use them wisely, so it sets them to the task of locating and destroying Allied AWACS platforms. This puts even F-22s and F-35s at risk, as the downing of an AWACS means friendly fighters must use their own radars to locate and prosecute targets. American stealth aircraft have some capability to passively detect enemy aircraft, especially those blasting out their own radar, and the ASA arrays can function as both a radar and a jammer to degrade enemy targeting radars. But the moment they light up their radars, their stealth is significantly compromised. The air war favors the Allies in the long run, but China in the short run, with its ability to fly directly from home bases and the mighty PL-15 in its inventory. The US has a counter to China's missile, the AIM-260, which has an estimated 33% greater range than the PL-15, but the weapon is still not out of testing and into operational use. Month 2 both sides have suffered catastrophic losses to their air fleets, but now the war shifts significantly to the Allies' favor. As J-16s and J-20s run in short supply, China's relying on older and older jets. To make matters worse, inland air bases have come under attack by submarine-launched cruise missiles and standoff weapons from American B-51 and B-1 bombers. Stealthy B-2 bombers slip inland to launch attacks against logistics networks and military bases on the mainland, a provocative move that many feared would be an escalation of the war. However, the U.S. cannot win unless it strikes directly at Chinese bases and slows the rate of operations. China's invasion is ground to a standstill as fighting rages for control over major Taiwanese cities. China carefully observed Russia's invasion of Ukraine and saw how Volodymyr Zelensky had been a rallying figure for both Ukraine's armed forces and the international community. Thus, at the start of the war, it activated assassination teams already on the island in an attempt to kill the Taiwanese president and senior government and military leadership. Under protection from their own special forces and with the invasion pending, the attacks were largely foiled, but several key generals and politicians were dispatched by China's kill teams. The U.S. Pacific Surface Fleet is now in the action and in the business of sinking Chinese ships. China has more ships than the U.S., approximately 246 more, but U.S. ships pack a bigger punch. This is benefits and drawbacks. U.S. ships can stay in the fight longer before needing resupply, but the loss of each U.S. vessel has a bigger impact on the overall force than a Chinese loss. However, the U.S. Navy has put its foot directly on China's jugular, and China had no hope of shaking it off. In the Straits of Malacca and the Gulf of Oman, U.S. Navy ships patrol for Chinese merchant vessels. With over 60% of its trade coming in via the ocean and the majority of its oil, China is critically dependent on sea trade for its economic prosperity. Yet China's Navy doesn't have the ability to challenge the U.S. Navy far from its own shores and has no hope of dislodging the U.S. blockade, especially now that NATO ships have joined the effort. The attack on U.S. bases across the Pacific automatically triggered an Article 5 declaration. And while European power is largely concerned with containing further Russian aggression, America's European allies have been providing a steady stream of anti-ship missiles and air-to-air -air weapons. Now a number of their aircraft and both surface vessels and submarines have joined the fight in the Pacific. China's trade artery has been severed, and it faces a global alliance. Its only hope is to win the war in Taiwan quickly and force the government to capitulate. However, the Taiwanese people stubbornly refused to surrender, and millions of people have volunteered to fight the invaders. Only a portion of them can be armed, but this means China must bring over 2 million troops across the strait if it hopes to pacify the island and its population. This is becoming increasingly impossible as the Allies achieve air and naval superiority over China, and Chinese oil supplies dwindle with U.S. submarine-launched cruise missile strikes against pipelines bringing in oil from Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula. The Chinese people are forced to ration oil and other supplies, growing increasingly unhappy with the toll of the war. They were promised a swift victory over Taiwan and its American allies, but Taiwan is refusing to capitulate. 
The war will rage for months more to come, with horrible losses on both sides. It will take America a decade to rebuild its air and naval forces, forcing it to lean heavily on its allies in the meantime to maintain global stability. But in the end, this is the US's greatest strength, its global network of partners and allies. China, meanwhile, will be economically devastated by a failed invasion, with the US refusing to end the war until the entirety of the People's Liberation Army Air Force and Navy both are destroyed, so that China may not threaten the Pacific again. The US and Philippines just outplayed China in the South Pacific, and President Xi Jinping is fuming mad about it. Did a recent US and Philippine deal just prevent World War III, or only ensure it'll happen anyway? On February 2, 2023, with the stroke of a pen, the US undid nearly a decade of hard work by China in attempting to sway the Philippines away from its ally. The troubling thing is that it almost worked, and the results would have been disastrous not just for the US but for the liberal and democratic world order. The Philippines is one of the most important nations in the South Pacific, thanks to its geographic location on the world stage. It sits astride the world's most important shipping lanes, which means that the nation can have a direct impact on the trade of most of the world's countries. This is of critical concern to China, seeing as the vast majority of its exports travel by sea. Even more importantly, though, is the fact that the nation imports over 60% of its oil from the Middle East via the sea. This is why China has worked so hard to modernize its navy and now has the world's largest navy. But that's not telling the full story, because pound for pound, China's navy still doesn't come close to matching the might of the United States' own navy. In battle force missiles alone, or the number of missiles for anti-ship, surface attack, and air defense, the US still leads by nearly 50%, though China is working to close the gap. China's no pushover, though, and its new Type 055 destroyers are the most modern in the world, prompting the US to hurry its own new destroyer design into construction. Most important to China is its new aircraft carriers under construction. Its Fujian Type 003 carrier is undergoing sea trials at the moment, and a second carrier is under construction, bringing China's total carrier force up to three. However, it's rumored that China is already constructing its Type 004 carrier, which will be a true rival to the US Ford class. These carriers will be critically important, because without them, China simply can't operate far from its own shores against major powers like the US. And China desperately needs to be able to project power deep into the South Pacific and Indian Oceans both. Currently, China's crippling Achilles heel is the multiple choke points in the Straits of Malacca, or Gulf of Oman, where the US Navy could interdict its maritime shipping. Modern Chinese forces face the exact same problem that World War II Imperial Japan faced. It's too easily cut off from vital imports by sea, despite its massive land border with the rest of Asia. This has been a big reason why China pushed its massive Belt and Road Initiative with very mixed results. America's new deal with the Philippines is the largest expansion of military access to the former U.S. colony in 30 years. The agreement opens up four new airfields for U.S. aircraft and grants America the right to maintain equipment and personnel in those bases. Now the U.S. has access to nine total air bases on the island, allowing it to greatly expand its military presence in the South Pacific. Sitting astride China's sea lines of communication, the U.S. can enforce a blockade of China with ease from the Philippines in case of war. But that's not the only reason this new U.S.-Philippine agreement has Xi Jinping hopping mad, because the expansion of American air power in the Philippines also threatens the most important item on China's agenda, the forceful reunification of Taiwan. The Philippines' northernmost island is just over 100 miles from Taiwan, and this is significant for the U.S. and its allies in case China tries to invade the island. Any war against China over Taiwan will be one waged at sea and in the air, but China holds all of the advantages in both regards. Its forces can safely operate from bases and ports on its own very heavily defended soil, while the US and its partners have to fly aircraft from hundreds of miles away to defend Taiwan. The closest airfields outside the Philippines to Taiwan are located in South Korea, hundreds of miles away from Taiwan. The bulk of US air power in the Pacific, though, is either on aircraft carriers in Japan or in Guam. US carriers will likely be forced to stay significantly far away from Taiwan in case of war due to the threat of Chinese anti-ship ballistic missiles, of which China has hundreds, and aircraft flying from Japan or Guam would take as much as half a day just to arrive on station. This is a huge logistical challenge for US forces in the region, as it limits how fast they can respond to a conflict, how long they can be engaged in combat operations, and how fast sorties can be generated. When you consider that U.S. stealth aircraft can only carry four long-range air-to-air missiles each, it only further complicates the air defense of Taiwan. But airfields in the Philippines are much closer to Taiwan, 
and would allow the U.S. to more rapidly generate sorties to defend the island. This makes U.S. defense much more credible and helps deter Chinese ambitions to seize Taiwan by force. Ultimately, the best way to win a war is to never fight it at all. But access to four additional airfields in the Philippines are also important for another reason. It gives China more targets to shoot at. Currently, China has enough ballistic missiles in its People's Liberation Army rocket force to engage every single U.S. vessel and saturate its air defenses, with missiles left over to target every U.S. airbase in the region. This will be catastrophic for American efforts to defend Taiwan. And in dozens of war game scenarios, when China struck first in a bolt out of the blue attack, it managed to destroy as much as 90% of the U.S.'s air power in the region while it was still on the ground. Runways can be quickly repaired, but aircraft are much harder and costlier to repair. The U.S. has deployed an array of missile defenses in its bases in the Pacific, but it's still woefully short of the number believed to be needed for even a portion of current U.S. assets to survive a surprise ballistic missile attack. Many American military leaders have been ringing the alarm bell for years, but America's Congress has been slow to act. This is where access to four additional airfields becomes so important. China now has to plan on saturating four additional airfields and has to deal with the logistical headache of trying to keep dozens of airfields knocked out of commission for the duration of the war against the U.S., an extremely implausible proposition. Each new airfield that the U.S. forces gain access to diminishes China's ability to keep U.S. air forces out of the fight. The American-Filipino Agreement is itself an expansion of a 2014 Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. At the time, the future of the U.S.-Philippines relations were very uncertain. The Philippines was and still is a critical U.S. ally, and both sides have enjoyed a long defense relationship. But conflict quickly arose between President Rodrigo Duterte and President Barack Obama. The rift between the U.S. and the Philippines was caused by President Duterte's very violent persecution of a war on the nation's crime. Duterte, a populist authoritarian, came to power on a campaign promising to end violent and drug crime in the Philippines, and upon taking office, empowered his police forces to do everything necessary to crack down on criminals. Very quickly, however, Duterte's war on crime became an outright slaughter, with thousands of drug dealers and drug users killed at the hands of the police. Drug users were even murdered in vigilante-style killings, their bodies left out in the street with a sign around their neck spelling out their crime. When President Obama called out Duterte on the violent abuses of his war against crime, Duterte responded by calling the American president a son of a bitch and telling him he could go to hell. Duterte threatened to break up the security partnership between the Philippines and the U.S., saying that he would seek out new relationships with Russia and China. For President Xi Jinping, this was Christmas in July, and his diplomats immediately leapt at the opportunity to turn the Philippines from a potential adversary into an ally. However, the relationship between the two allies remained strong through Duterte's troubling presidency, and the new president, Bongbong Marcos, was quickly to repair the U.S.-Filipino rift. The defense agreement between the two countries is not without risk to the Philippines, as it places them even further onto the crosshairs of long-range Chinese ballistic missile attack. But it comes with serious benefits as well. For starters, there's no better guarantee of national security than having U.S. troops stationed alongside your own troops. Second, though, is the influx of U.S. spending in the areas where the U.S. forces will now be based. On top of ongoing cash flow from off-duty airmen and soldiers, the U.S. is also investing $82 million directly into the construction of its bases in the Philippines. This is significant for the local economy, as unlike China's Belt and Road Initiative, the U.S. is hiring local companies rather than simply using its own. Further, the U.S. has agreed to give $100 million in military aid to the Filipino military. China's military expansion into the South China Sea is also a great incentive for the Philippines to seek expanded U.S. presence on their islands. Famously, China and the Philippines have been clashing over small islands and reefs in waters recognized internationally as belonging to the Philippines. In 1995, China built a small structure on Mischief Reef, well inside the Philippines' territorial waters. It promised it was only a shelter for fishermen. However, in the typical Chinese strategy of taking an inch a year, today the island is home to an entire Chinese military base, including air defense missile batteries and Sea Whiz gun emplacements. The reef even features a runway long enough for China's largest planes. This has been part of China's militarization of reefs across the region, as it used dredges to create artificial islands. An international ruling at The Hague ruled against China's claim of ownership to these waters and in favor of the Philippines, Vietnam, and other nations to which China said, cool story bro, and kept on building what are essentially unsinkable aircraft carriers. 
Now these military bases pose a significant threat to the U.S. and its partners in the region, and have been militarized to such a degree that the U.S. Navy would have to dedicate significant resources to their destruction before being able to engage in combat operations near Taiwan. In response to this new agreement between the U.S. and Philippines, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Mao Ning stated that the deal would escalate tensions and endanger peace and stability in the region. In an attempt to counter the deal, China spent considerable effort swaying the Filipino public against the U.S., and the announcement was not greeted without criticism. However, public opinion on the U.S. remained strongly favorable, with about 63% of surveyed Filipinos through 2018 to 2019 all having positive opinions of the U.S. This follows a historical trend where the U.S. has been seen as the favorite foreign nation of most Filipinos since the early 2000s. A 2022 poll showed that 89% of Filipinos had a great deal of trust or a fair amount of trust in the U.S., and the vast majority favored stronger economic ties with America than China. This is in comparison with Filipino views on China, which are overwhelmingly negative. In the same 2022 poll, only 5% of those surveyed had a great deal of trust in China, and 28% had a fair amount of trust. 67% had no trust at all or very little trust in China. This put China behind even Russia despite the war in Ukraine. The time of Duterte's cozying up to China is now over, and the US-Philippine relationship has been righted. This is bad news for China, which has seen half a decade of influence operations go up in smoke, similar to its efforts to sway Australia away from the US. What's bad for China is good for the world, though, as a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be disastrous for the current world order. In a century increasingly defined by the struggle of authoritarianism versus democracy, China's destruction of Taiwan would be a significant low point in world affairs. But the threat is far more practical as well, as Taiwan manufactures most of the world's most sensitive electronic components, and a Chinese monopoly on those devices that modern economies run on would mean the Chinese Communist Party would have direct leverage over every nation on the planet. Either do as President Xi wants, or you'll be denied the microchips your economy needs to continue running. With a new Chinese-Russian partnership, which explicitly stated both nations' interest in pushing their version of authoritarian government on the world, the fate of Taiwan could end up defining the entire course of the 21st century. Sources within the Department of Defense estimate that war with China is inevitable and likely to happen within 18 to 24 months from July of 2023. While the war will be costly, there is one undeniable fact. China is terrified of the U.S. Navy. But it doesn't mean that America will win. In any confrontation between the U.S. and China, it's both sides' navies who will do the bulk of the fighting and decide the very fate of the Pacific and beyond. If China wins, its authoritarian model will spread around the world as it uses its global near-monopoly on semiconductors to bend nations to its whim. Think you're safe in Europe? Until Macron figures out how to run sensitive electronics off of croissants? Think again! Because even our European cousins' fates are intertwined with America's struggle with China in the Pacific. America's win conditions for any war with China are resolute. Nothing less than the total destruction of the Chinese Navy and the Chinese Air Forces will do. While America isn't seeking confrontation, it has stated goals of what it will accomplish if it happens. The U.S. will not broker any chance of a resurgent China challenging it again two decades later, in the style of early 20th century Germany. Thus, the U.S. will seek to absolutely smash China's ability to project power past its own shores. Standing firmly in the U.S. camp are Japan and Australia, and heavily favoring America, as well as treaty-bound to help defend it, are the Philippines and South Korea. That leaves China as the outlier in its own neighborhood, as every significant power on its bloc has opted to throw its lot in with the U.S. And while a comparison of both sides' navies is important, what's even more important is that the U.S. will not be fighting alone. If China chooses to go to war, it'll be stepping into a cage match with no friends. Well, maybe North Korea, if it's feeling particularly suicidal that day. So what does the tale of the tape tell us? One-on-one, -on -one, the American and Chinese navies are the two most powerful naval forces in the world. China has pulled off nothing short of an economic and industrial miracle, growing its navy in 20 years from a brown water force incapable of challenging a single U.S. carrier strike group directly off its own shores to one that'll soon be a bona fide blue water navy capable of global operations. 
In numbers alone, China fields 730 ships versus America's 484, though these are not all fighting ships, as both navies have about as many support vessels as combat vessels. However, when it comes down to fighting ships, China outnumbers America. The Chinese have 78 submarines versus America's 68, 50 destroyers versus America's 92, 43 frigates versus zero for the US, 72 corvettes versus America's 22, and 150 coastal patrol craft versus the US's 10. The only categories the US outnumbers China is in aircraft carriers with 11 versus 2 and amphibious assault ships, sometimes known as light carriers, with 9 versus 3. The Chinese Navy has more combat hulls than the US, prompting the Secretary of the Navy to comment that the US desperately needed to increase the size of its fleet, coupling his statement with the bad news that America cannot keep pace with the Chinese shipbuilding. However, that's not the full story because when it comes to tonnage, the US Navy has nearly twice the tonnage of the Chinese Navy, and that matters when a significant amount of that tonnage comes from 11 American supercarriers, each fielding a small air force that on their own would be a formidable challenge for most nations' own air forces. The fact is, the US has fatter ships than China, which means they can take more punishment, have more capabilities, and field more weapons. Five years ago, the US had nearly tripled the number of battle force missiles than China, a total count of every type of missile a warship could carry. By 2030, China will have closed that gap significantly, but the US is still estimated to have a 50% lead. However, China is not resting on its laurels, and while the Pentagon wants 350 manned combat ships by 2045, China is projected to have 460 by 2030. The rate of production in China is incredible, with China pumping out about 20 warships a year, while the US struggles to get six out. It doesn't help that China has 13 shipyards and most of them have more capacity than America's eight shipyards. Just one has more capacity than all of American shipyards combined. But that's not the full story. During the Cold War, after all, the Soviets had a larger navy than America, but nobody would have ever argued the Soviet ships and submarines were an equal match to their American counterparts. The US is a firm believer in quality over quantity, and historically this has proven to not just be a war-winning strategy, but one that delivers extremely lopsided victories. While the newest batch of Chinese destroyers are featuring better radars than those present on older US hulls, the overall advantage is still squarely on the American side. The US also fields more and better missiles than China, and on a platform-to-platform -platform basis the advantage is almost always heavily in America's favor. But the US isn't resting on its heels, and the Navy has an ambitious program to tackle the numbers disparity between the two sides through technology, of course. Currently, the Navy is testing a variety of unmanned vessels that will one day soon be complementing U.S. task forces. Already, the Navy is using unmanned drones for aerial refueling of its combat aircraft, which frees up platforms which would normally be reserved for the role, increasing the overall power of each carrier's air wing. But soon drones will be doing everything, from patrolling for enemy submarines to carrying out mining or demining duties, engaging in suicide attacks against high-value targets, and possibly even serving as nothing more than floating arsenal ships, drone platforms with as many as 500 vertical launch cells that will simply follow US fleets around until they're needed to engage targets. America is betting big on unmanned tech to level the playing field between the two sides, because while having bigger, more capable ships is good, it also means that that the loss of each individual ship is a bigger proportional loss of combat power. What if war broke out today, though? The regular and naval air forces of both sides would play heavily in any conflict in the South Pacific, and while China has made great strides, US air forces still leave it in the dust. In 1996, most of the Chinese Air Force was made up of hopelessly obsolete second-generation aircraft, either direct purchases from the Soviet Union or copies produced under license or simply reverse-engineered and stolen by Chinese engineers. Today, over half of Chinese Air Forces are made up of fourth-generation platforms, with a growing fleet of fifth-generation J-20s, of which China is estimated to have around 200. To be fair, the J-20 is widely considered to be more of a four-and-a-half than a true fifth-generation design, as there are multiple features, such as canards, that are decidedly unstealthy. Much like the Russians, the Chinese have also found it difficult to master the production techniques required for the incredibly tight tolerances necessary for fifth-generation airframes, evidenced by visible seams in the aircraft's body panels which would increase its visibility versus radar. Materials technology also lags behind the US and the West overall, as does the development of advanced avionics and other sensors. Lastly, the J-20 has underpowered engines, as China has struggled to develop native engines that can match the performance of American engines. And it's not just sheer power, it's efficiency and reliability. 
One American F-16 pilot remarked how when speaking with Chinese pilots, they expressed shock and surprise when he informed them of his flight around the world in his F-16. Chinese engines are notoriously unreliable, and it's estimated that the Chinese would only get a few hours of combat time out of each engine before needing serious maintenance. As it stands, Chinese jet engine reliability is about one quarter of American or European jet engines, a significant problem. Underpowered engines have also hamstrung the development of a true carrier fighter, with China's J-15 Flying Shark incapable of lifting the type of loads an American F-18 would, limiting either combat range or armament. China's engine problem stems from its history of imitating rather than innovating. Its most advanced engine, the WS-15, began development in the late 1990s and took flight in 2022 with a J-20. However, the engine has shown significant reliability problems as China copes with the power requirements of modern fighters. And that's a problem China is trying to correct by building relationships with foreign manufacturers and universities as it attempts to improve its human capital by sending students and trainees abroad. The United States has recognized this tactic and worked to limit the access Chinese students have to its aerospace industry and educational programs. Manufacturing is also a significant problem for China, as the world's most advanced machine tools are all foreign-made. China can source components for its engines on its own, but it relies on Western, Japanese, or Korean machines for manufacturing. Chinese aerospace firms are forced to import machine tools from German, Japanese, Italian, and South Korean firms, and this poses a critical risk to China. When Russia couldn't match the West's 5- and 7-axis machine tooling capabilities in the early 1990s and early 2000s, demand for its defense products shrank considerably. These high-precision machine tools are critical for the development of advanced aircraft structures, compressor blades, and inertial navigation systems. China is also struggling to figure out how to optimize its manufacturing process, and has been attempting to steal secrets from the West for years. In 2018, Chinese-American Zhao Qingjiang was convicted by the Department of Justice for stealing trade secrets regarding turbine sealing. Chinese intelligence officer Xu Yangzheng was discovered to be targeting experts from Western aerospace companies and plying them for sensitive manufacturing data and attempting to get them to speak to their Chinese counterparts to improve Chinese efficiency. Despite plenty of theft of intellectual property, the country is basically built on it, the one thing that China can't steal is expertise, and its native workforce lacks the decades of training and experience to properly implement the stolen knowledge. That situation is unlikely to change anytime soon, as China historically has a significant problem attracting talented immigrants. On an airframe basis, though, the U.S. has a significant advantage over China, with a completely modern fleet that sees ongoing modernization efforts through either upgrade programs or the acquisition of new aircraft like the F-35. It's no secret that the U.S. absolutely loves its air forces, and it fields nearly twice as many fighters as China does. It also has seven times as many special mission aircraft critical for modern success than China does. Notable mentions, however, are the F-22 Raptor, which blows the J-20 out of the sky, literally, if it ever came down to it. The Raptor is facing a modernity problem, as its old architecture makes it prohibitively expensive to significantly upgrade its electronic brains, but it's still significantly more lethal than anything in the Chinese fleet. Even China's most advanced balloon technology is no match for the deadliest plane in the sky. The Raptor's ever-evolving little brother, though, is what China should be the most worried about. The F-35 is not as stealthy as the Raptor, but what it lacks in stealth it more than makes up for in literally everything else. The aircraft is designed from the ground up to be a true 21st century weapon. It features high levels of automation unmatched in any other platform, which lets the pilot focus on the job that matters, killing bad guys or avoiding being killed in return. A system of distributed cameras also allows its pilot to look through the frame of his own aircraft, giving him unparalleled situational awareness. But the F-35's real strength is its ability to speak with other weapon systems in the U.S. arsenal, in effect making it a miniature airborne air traffic control. It can even guide the weapons fired by other aircraft or surface platforms to their targets, allowing it to use its stealth to penetrate into airspace that its fourth-generation cousins couldn't, while guiding their long-range weapons to targets it can see. But the U.S. isn't done there, because even before the F-35 fully replaces that F-18 fleet, the U.S. Navy is already designing its next-generation naval fighter. This sixth-generation aircraft is pure speculation at the moment, though the Air Force has confirmed that its own version has already been flying for about two years. What we do know is that the Navy wants to have a much greater range than either the F-18 or F-35, a greater payload capacity, and it needs to come with the capability of flying alongside drone wings 
Kingmen. With Chinese anti-ship missiles and ever greater concern for the U.S. Navy, future fighters will need to operate from carriers based further from hostile shores, necessitating a greater fuel capacity. Drone wingmen, meanwhile, will enable various capabilities on attribute platforms, which right now would need to be undertaken by expensive manned aircraft. Drones, for example, could use their own onboard radars for situational awareness, while allowing their manned mothership to keep hers powered down and retain her stealth. When it comes to hitting where it hurts, China has developed an impressive array of long-range anti-ship missiles. The YJ-12 is the primary weapon used by China's bombers and its large array of coastal missile batteries, with an estimated range of about 300 miles. It's a subsonic weapon, though, and thus vulnerable to robust American air defenses, though an ability to conduct a supersonic sprint in its terminal phase increases its lethality. The YJ-18 is the primary missile used by China's submarines and surface warships and is capable of being fired from vertical launch cell systems. It features a range of about 330 miles and is also a subsonic weapon with the ability to perform a supersonic sprint in its terminal phase. The YJ-83 is fielded on Chinese attack aircraft and smaller surface warships. It only has a range of 110 miles and is a purely subsonic weapon. This is the equivalent of bringing a knife to a gunfight, though, and it's unlikely any Chinese aircraft or ship could survive within 110 miles of a large American surface action group. The DF-21 and DF-26, however, have been termed carrier killers and are truly up to the task, at least on paper. These large ballistic missiles are launched from land-based platforms and feature a range of 930 and 1850 miles respectively, putting even targets far out at sea at significant risk. They are hypersonic weapons, though only in the sense that they are ballistic missiles which reach hypersonic speeds. Being ballistic weapons, though, they fly in a predictable path, making them vulnerable to U.S. air defense missiles. China's only modern hypersonic anti-ship missile, the YJ-21, was only revealed in 2022. Details about this weapon remain shrouded in mystery, but China claims that it's a true modern hypersonic weapon defined by the ability to maneuver at hypersonic speeds, something ballistic missiles can't do. It's this maneuverability and extreme speed that makes these types of weapons so dangerous, as it makes intercepting them incredibly difficult. However, the YJ-21 has not been deployed in large numbers, and its capabilities, range, and lethality are completely unknown. What is known is that modern hypersonic weapons are incredibly expensive, and it's not economically possible to field them in large numbers. That's why the U.S. has dropped some of its own hypersonic programs, opting instead to increase the penetrability of its next-generation conventional missiles. The U.S. has relied on the Harpoon anti-ship missile for decades. A Cold War stalwart, the Harpoon is a capable weapon, but one that faces increasingly more sophisticated air defenses. This is why the U.S. Navy has begun fielding a completely new weapon, its first new anti-ship missile since the Cold War, and it's planning to field them in large numbers, with producer Lockheed Martin opening a second production line to make both the long-range anti-ship missile, or LRASM, and its air-launched variant used by both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy, the Air-to-Air -air Standoff Missile Extended Range, or JASM-ER. With things heating up in the Pacific, the U.S. has realized that its current stockpile of anti-ship missiles will likely not be enough for a protracted conflict. Now, Lockheed Martin is projected to be building 1,000 LRASMs and JASMers a year. These advanced weapons feature stealth characteristics that significantly reduce an enemy's engagement time, increasing the probability of penetrating air defenses. However, being stealthy weapons means they're limited to subsonic speeds, but that also means that they use regular jet engines rather than rocket motors, which greatly increases their range compared to Chinese missiles. The JASMer is specially designed to be launched by aircraft well outside of China's increasing anti access area denial capabilities, estimated at over 575 miles, or over twice that of the El Rasm. But the U.S. isn't completely out of the hypersonic game, despite scrapping their air-launched rapid response weapon. Instead, it's focused efforts on building an air-breathing hypersonic missile named the Hypersonic Air-Launched Anti-Surface Warfare, or HALO missile. Still deeply in testing phases, the aim is to produce a financially responsible hypersonic weapon that can be built in significant numbers, a true challenge for any hypersonic weapon. As the El Rasm builds in numbers, though, the Harpoon is receiving upgrades to make it more relevant on modern battlefields. Its Block 2 Plus upgrade includes a new GPS receiver and flight control system, which will help it find targets in a complicated environment, as well as a two-way data link to allow it to be retargeted in flight, and an infrared seeker for all-weather capability. However, the Harpoon is old tech, and Navy war games show it. 
which is why the El Rasm is being rushed into production today. With a host of new weapons on the way and significant legacy capability receiving upgrades, the US Navy is a terrifying force to reckon with even given China's superior numbers. More importantly, the US will not fight this war alone and can count on a number of allies and partners to shore up its own numbers. In the end, that is the secret to the US's true lethality and a capability that no amount of espionage or industrial theft will ever deliver to China. 20 major surface ships destroyed, two supercarriers sunk, 3,000 American airmen and sailors dead. That's the price for Taiwan's freedom in case of a Chinese attack. A recent spate of comprehensive war games took a look at the possibility of defending Taiwan from Chinese attack. Running over 20 simulations of varying degrees of intensity, including handicaps for US forces, the war games made a startling discovery. China fails to take Taiwan in nearly all scenarios, but the US pays a huge price for it. But short, should the US even be defending a small island nation thousands of miles from its own shores? And why should it pay for its freedom with its own blood and capital? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes again, with many detailed reasons why. Let us explain. Taiwan is more than a thorn in China's side. The island nation was a refuge for the Chinese nationalists who fled the mainland after losing the Chinese Civil War shortly after World War II. Since then, the dictatorship that once ruled the island has transitioned into a flourishing democracy with some of the highest voter turnout rates of any democracy in the world. The Taiwanese people fiercely defend their democracy, and with polls showing that nearly 80% of Taiwanese people are in favor of stronger ties to the US than China, there doesn't seem to be a diplomatic way for China to annex the island. For China, Taiwan is an existential threat to its ruling Chinese Communist Party. The CCP has enjoyed complete control over the Chinese people for nearly a century, but as China modernizes and more of its citizens travel to study and live abroad, discontent grows at home over the dictatorial rule of the CCP. Chinese dissidents are increasingly calling for democratic reforms and the end to the CCP surveillance state, with programs like Social Capital, where each citizen is assigned a social score based on their good behavior and support for the government, driving a lot of Chinese youth who can afford it out of the country. Taiwan offers a different model for Chinese dissidents, a democratic one. Sitting less than 100 miles off its own coast, Taiwanese democracy is infectious, and the CCP cannot allow the contagion to continue unchecked for much longer. But reuniting Taiwan by force is also vital for China's national security and its ambition to become the world's reigning superpower. Currently, China is hemmed in by US-aligned nations in what's known as the First Island Chain. Established during the Cold War to contain the Soviet Union and China, the First Island Chain stretches from Japan through Taiwan down to the Philippines and ensures that China cannot project military power into the Pacific without being attacked from all sides. Taking Taiwan would break that First Island Chain and seriously complicate matters for American allies such as Japan and the Philippines. With free access to the Pacific, China could also begin to field more blue water capable forces which would allow it to protect its critical seaborne trade where it matters most, in the Indian Ocean and in the Straits of Malacca. Both are natural choke points for Chinese trade, where India, the US, or any Chinese rival could in effect completely strangle the Chinese economy by denying it critical trade. With most of its oil imported via the sea, China is extremely vulnerable to trade disruption. But Taiwan is important to both the US and China for one other major reason. If Taiwan fell into China's hands today, China could very well shape the face of the planet for the foreseeable future. Back in the late 1980s, the Taiwanese began to invest in semiconductor manufacturing. Now the nation provides nearly two-thirds of the global supply of semiconductors and all of its most advanced models. The US, waking up from a deep Cold War victory-induced stupor, just recently realized that all its eggs were in the Taiwanese basket, and working with Taiwan will be opening up a semiconductor manufacturing hub in Arizona. However, the most advanced 3mm models will continue to only be produced on Taiwan itself, a clever piece of insurance. Semiconductors are important because the tiny electronic devices are present in all advanced electronics everywhere on the Earth. Without access to semiconductors, national economies would come to a screeching halt. We already saw the effect that a simple slowdown of manufacturing caused when electronics and vehicle prices skyrocketed halfway through the global COVID pandemic. If China were to take Taiwan, it would then be in control of most of the world's manufacturing of semiconductors, and any nation that did not want its economy to collapse would in effect have to do as China instructed. And that would include the United States of America, because without Taiwanese semiconductors, all of the US military's most advanced weapons basically become one-time use with no resupply. Whether they know it or not, the American people are directly bound to the freedom of Taiwan. A Chinese invasion of Taiwan is unlikely but not impossible, and in fact only increasing in likelihood. 
China under President Xi Jinping has repeatedly stated that reunification is not up for debate. What is up for debate is whether Taiwan agrees to reunify peacefully or not. As Taiwan shows no sign of wanting to come under the umbrella of the CCP and Chinese influence operations have hilariously backfired on the island, a military option grows in likelihood year over year. The good news is that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is likely to fail. The bad news is that it will only fail if the US is prepared to pay dearly for it. In the most pessimistic war game scenarios, the United States suffered up to 20 large surface combat ships sunk, including two supercarriers. The US and Japan both lost hundreds of aircraft, about 90% of those on the ground, in the opening stages of the war as air bases from Japan to Guam came under ballistic missile attack from the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force. Nearly 4,000 US sailors and airmen are killed in action, with many more wounded. The United States loses more material over a few months of war than it has since World War II. Yet, in all scenarios but those specifically designed to handicap the United States, Taiwan remains independent and China suffers a horrific loss. 100,000 of its troops are either killed or captured on Taiwan. Over 50 of its large surface combatants are sunk, including two aircraft carriers. Nearly its entire amphibious assault fleet is destroyed and over 150 aircraft are also shot down. The US's ability to project power globally is severely curtailed as it takes years to rebuild its armed forces, but China's is absolutely crippled, taking decades to rebuild its capabilities and recover from the costs of the war. But a US-Taiwan victory relies on multiple very important factors, and it's unsure if the United States could realistically or even would try to meet all those goals in time to stop a Chinese invasion. The first of these factors is the cooperation of Japan. Without Japan, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan is much more likely to succeed. Not only does Japan provide a significant boost to combat power in the region, but it's a critical base of operations for American aircraft and ships. Would Japan really commit to fighting China alongside the US, though? In the opening hours of the conflict, China would have to make a very hard decision to strike American air bases in Japan or not. Attacking these air bases would cripple America's ability to threaten China's invasion fleet in the first week or two of the war, giving it a critical window to move heavy combat power to the island. However, it would also run the risk of immediately bringing Japan into the fight on America's side. So China would have to decide if the gain was worth the risk. And simply put, it is. China has no choice. If it doesn't eliminate US bases in Japan with heavy and sustained missile attack, then its invasion of Taiwan has no chance of succeeding. Japan is already almost certain to join the war against China on America's side anyway. Japan and China have their own territorial dispute over a chain of islands that both sides claim, but China is a massive threat to Japan who is also very dependent on seaborne trade. Right now, Japanese free trade is guaranteed by the might of the US Navy, but if China won Taiwan and kicked the US out of the South Pacific, Japanese trade would be at the mercy of China. This is a strategically unacceptable position for the Japanese. Japan has already moved toward an increased readiness position in regard to China. After decades of embracing pacifism, a rising China and its bullying of its neighbors has prompted Japan to take the unprecedented step of giving up pacifism. Japanese forces are now gearing up for the offensive, not a defensive war, which includes purchasing long-range strike weapons. Enshrined within the Japanese constitution is a clause which now allows Japan to deploy its self-defense forces proactively to fight far from home if it's believed the conflict threatens the security of Japan itself. A US-China conflict is exactly why this clause was drafted, and unless there's massive shifts in the Japanese politics, Japan's inclusion in the conflict is guaranteed. China must also weigh the decision to attack facilities in Australia with its long-range ballistic missiles. Increasingly, the deepening US-Australian alliance is resulting in the creation of air bases and other facilities to be used in case of regional conflict by the US air and naval power. From Australia, US tanker aircraft could accompany strike aircraft right to the outer threat envelope of Chinese defenses, letting American air power join the fight at a time it's looking increasingly likely that naval air power won't be able to do the job alone. Australia can also provide several surface vessels in support of allied operations against the Chinese, but starting in the 2030s it'll be able to conduct long-range undersea operations thanks to a fleet of US-made nuclear submarines to be transferred to Australia. Upon announcement of the AUKUS security partnership between Australia, the UK and America, China sent several diplomatic protests over the nuclear submarines to be delivered to Australia, claiming the US was dangerously proliferating nuclear technology but the submarines will only be nuclear-powered, not nuclear-armed. 
giving them the range required to threaten Chinese vessels with conventional weapons. Next, the United States must lean heavily on its stealth fleet. In every war game scenario, conventional US air power was decimated by Chinese air defenses and fighters. The results were clear. Either the US needs to invest in many more conventional fleets, a mix of conventional and stealth, or on more stealth aircraft. Many critics favor the mixed fleet concept when looked at a purely kill-to-cost ratio. It makes no sense to purchase more conventional aircraft even if stealth aircraft are more expensive. The F-35 has an unclassified kill ratio of 25 or 35 to 1 in combat exercises where it's not purposefully being put at a disadvantage. Despite costing significantly more than conventional F-15s, the F-35 is simply going to survive longer and be more useful. But it's stealth bombers that are vitally important here, and this coincides with the third great contention facing the United States in defense of Taiwan, should the US carry out strikes inside of China itself. As has been noted, no nuclear power has ever been subject to conventional strikes inside its own border. Many fear that US strikes inside of the Chinese mainland would escalate the situation and tempt the use of nuclear weapons and thus argue against it. Yet not carrying out these strikes would enable China to essentially carry out combat operations wholly undisturbed, a frankly stupid proposition when the US and its alliances are already at a massive range disadvantage. Unless threatened with nuclear weapons itself or with the prospect of national destruction, China would not rely on the use of nuclear weapons for two reasons. First, it would become an immediate international pariah state, cut off from the global community. With its economy hugely reliant on exports, this is something China can ill afford. Also, if it aims to become the world's reigning superpower, it's going to need at least a considerable portion of the world to actually support it. Using nuclear weapons in retaliation to conventional strikes on its military facilities and infrastructure would kill any international support immediately. The second reason China won't use nukes is because the US also has nukes, and more of them. China is increasing the size of its nuclear arsenal, but it would be national suicide to launch a nuclear attack against the US. Attacking Chinese infrastructure, port facilities, and airfields would allow the US to throw off the momentum of a Chinese attack on Taiwan and severely curtail losses for itself and its allies. But there's only one option on the table for penetrating China's extremely dense air defense network – stealth bombers. The current fleet of B-2 bombers simply are not enough, which is why the US is rushing the B-21 Raider into full-rate production. With plans to acquire over a hundred of the aircraft, the American B-21 Raider fleet may even be enough to deter a war before it starts. Next, the US desperately needs to increase its stock of LRASMs. These new modern and extremely capable anti-ship missiles feature long ranges and stealth characteristics. In war game scenarios, LRASMs absolutely devastated the Chinese Navy, but the US has very low numbers of these brand new weapons. The US was buying about 20 to 25 of these missiles per year, but in 2021 signed a contract for 137 LRASMs. Total stockpile is unknown, but it's believed that the US only has a few hundred of these weapons, and this is frankly insufficient. If the US is either to win or deter a war from starting in the first place, it needs to field these missiles at a rate at least partly comparable to the older and much more vulnerable Harpoon missiles, which are increasingly ineffective against modern air defenses. Lastly, the remaining factor determining a US or Chinese victory in the Pacific is the US's willingness to respond. If America does not respond immediately and with the full might of its military, it risks entering the war at a later stage and facing an incredibly uphill battle. Without US and Allied air support, Taiwan is estimated to be able to resist for about three weeks before falling to the Chinese. To prevent this, the United States must immediately respond to Chinese invasion and without self-limiting deterrence factors such as not striking at the Chinese mainland to disrupt its combat operations. Any hesitation by the US only increases the cost later in terms of life and material, and it makes it less likely for the US allies in the region to involve themselves. A fall of Taiwan would not only set the same terrible precedent as a fall of Ukraine, that in the 21st century dictatorships can overcome democracies at will, but threatens to create a future where the world is largely influenced by the whims of a deeply anti-democratic and anti-human rights Chinese Communist Party. Snow covers the landscape. The air is quiet except for the sniffles of freezing men. All of a sudden, flares shoot up and trumpets start sounding. Men are rushed forward. The defenders awake from their frozen slumber to the sound of machine gun fire, with curses and screams filling the silence in between each shot. The horde of Chinese soldiers gets closer. No matter how many are gunned down, the wave of bodies keeps moving forward. Out of ammunition, the soldiers start readying their knives, brass knuckles, and grenades for a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Before they know it, Chinese troops start jumping into foxholes, and the organized defense becomes an every-man-for-himself melee. 
This isn't a scene taken from the Korean War, it's actually what Indian troops experienced a decade after it. And China and India could very well go to war again, but who would win? Despite India becoming one of the main proponents of UN peacekeeping missions and China not fighting in a war since 1979, these two nations fighting one another is a real possibility. The two superpowers have a long-standing border dispute that started in the 1950s. After India gained its independence from Great Britain, the country fought a series of full-scale wars with its new neighbor, Pakistan. But India was not done fighting border wars with its newfound neighbors. During the 1950s, the Chinese government attempted to broker one-sided deals with India regarding its claims to Indian territory. Having demonstrated their willingness to defend their sovereignty against Pakistan, the Indian government refused offers from Mao Zedong to establish a line of actual control, or LAC. The LAC was the name given to the border between the two countries, with the proposed LAC in 1962 extending past current Chinese positions. This infuriated Indian leaders, who then rejected the proposals. As a result, Chinese forces overran and several isolated Indian positions within the frontier area and northeast India in what became the 1962 Sino-Indian War. The fighting only stopped when China advanced to the line of actual control, with some units moving past it. After the two nations brokered a ceasefire, the Chinese said they would move their actual border 20 kilometers behind the LAC, and India agreed to this. But in the 60 years since the conflict, Chinese forces have moved past the decided border into the LAC, hence why the area is still heavily militarized and hotly disputed. Before we dive into who would win a war between India and China, we must first look at the possible options for what a war would look like. For the purposes of this video, we'll analyze two scenarios, the most likely course of action and the most dangerous course of action. For a conflict between these two, the most likely course of action would take place along their disputed land that borders from the northeast frontier down to the Siliguri Corridor, also known as the Chicken's Neck. These borders have been a political and military hot potato for over 60 years now, resulting in one major war, several large flare-ups, and thousands of territorial violations over the years. This highly contentious border would probably be the area for war to break out between the two countries. For the most dangerous scenario, this would mean full-on, peer-to-peer conflict between the two countries. This would most likely result if India bested China in their border war and China needed to save face. Conversely, there is a large majority of war hawks within the Indian population that would want to see a full-scale escalation with China if they ever attempted a repeat of the 1962 Sino-Indian War. Either way, a full-scale war between India and China is not outside the realm of possibility. Going back to the most likely course of action, China and India have been violating each other's borders since the conclusion of the 1962 war. But despite the numerous violations, these border clashes rarely make international news. This is because historically, only about 1-2% to of border incidents here get reported. The world is largely unaware of these skirmishes for a few reasons. First is the remote nature of the area. Situated in the Himalayan mountains and a part of the Tibetan plateau, the northeast frontier and northeastern India are very isolated, harsh places places to live, much less fight a military campaign. Secondly is because both nations want to minimize the impact of each other's territorial violations to maintain political stability. Though there are a large number of Chinese and Indian forces in the region, the area currently has some peculiar rules in place to dissuade full-out conflict from breaking out. For example, both sides have agreed that military patrols should not carry firearms. Surprisingly, this has been largely adhered to and is evidenced by the worst case of border violence since the 1962 war. On June 15, 2020, several hundred Chinese and Indian soldiers fought a six-hour medieval-style battle in the Galwan Valley. During the battle, both sides used knives, bayonets, clubs with barbed wire, and bats to pummel each other. Over the course of six hours, 20 Indian and an estimated 45 Chinese soldiers were killed, with 76 wounded on the Indian side alone. It's exactly this type of escalation that would most likely kick off another war between the two powers. <laughs> So in the event that another such skirmish like this started another border war, let's take a look at what each side would bring to the table. Starting with their armies, India and China have the first and second largest armies in the world in terms of personnel. In the blue corner, India boasts a force of just under 1.25 million active duty personnel. In the red corner, China comes in with around 300,000 less troops in their counterpart, the People's Liberation Army Ground Force. But the difference in numbers is deceiving. Over the past decade, China has started to shy away from its brute strength in numbers to focus on more precision weapons. On the other hand, India has opted to recruit heavily to bolster its army and make up for some critical gaps in technology. These critical technology gaps become more apparent when looking at the Indian Army's heavy equipment. 
Due to India towing the line between Washington and Moscow during the Cold War, their military, and especially their army, is equipped with a mix of Soviet, Russian, and Western equipment, and none of it is the best either side has had to offer. As for the army, the vast majority of their equipment is Russian or Soviet origin. Take their main battle tanks, for example. The primary main battle tank of the Indian Army is evenly split between the Russian T-90 and the Soviet T-72, fielding about 2,000 and 2,400 tanks respectively. These vehicles make up the bulk of India's armored force. As for the T-72, though being a battle-hardened platform seeing action across the globe, the US invasion of Iraq and the current war in Ukraine have shown that these legacy Soviet systems have little place on a modern battlefield. With known vulnerabilities to anti-tank systems like the British Inlaw or American Javelin, these Soviet tanks are vulnerable to modern top-down attack weapons. Due to the Chinese military's infamous campaign of stealing information and reverse engineering critical technology, they've developed their own domestic copy of the American Javelin, known as the HJ-12. If you put them side by side, you'd be hard-pressed to find many differences between the two. Purported to have a range just under the American Javelin at 2 kilometers, the Chinese HJ-12 has been in active service for several years. On the other hand, the Indian military is still in the process of creating a similar type of weapon system. Though they have carried out several successful tests over the past two years, it's unknown when this system will finally be rolled out and into active service. Until then, Indian forces will not have the capability to launch manned portable top-down attacks on armored vehicles like Chinese troops could. Instead, they'd have to rely on helicopters or improvised missile carriers like the NAG missile carrier that fires the NAG anti-tank missile. Though potent, this weapon system has also proven to have issues firing in environments with heavy smoke, fog, or dust. This is a big problem for India, who heavily relies on the Russian-built T-90s as the backbone of their armored force. The T-90 was Russia's solution to eventually replace the failed T-80 and the aging T-72 and T-64 series of tanks. Envisioned to have state-of-the-art sensors, fire control computers, and armor, the tank was supposed to be the best tank in Russian service, and arguably it is, even if Russia's plans for sophisticated electronics never really panned out the way it hoped. The cornerstone of the T-90 is its Arena Active Protection System. The only problem is, Russia did not include that system in its foreign sale agreements. Active self-protection systems are considered the gold standard for modern tanks. This is because tank armor can only get so thick and heavy before it starts to encumber the vehicle's movement. Active self-protection is a concept taken from naval warfare and put onto a tank. Here a series of radars scan for incoming missiles or projectiles. The tank can detect these threats and can either fire off flares or chaff for a soft kill or fire its own interceptors at it for a hard kill. Some tanks can even perform soft kills by jamming the radio waves that the missile's onboard radar is using. With that in mind, the Indian military doesn't have access to this critical technology because, as is common with export weapons, the host country selling it does not want to give away all the technology that goes along with it. Because Russia has kept the arguably pretty good Arena Active Protection System a state secret, India has been trying to outsource its procurement of more advanced protection systems to other countries to no avail so far. Despite not being able to find a good supplier for active protection systems, India has produced its own completely indigenous tank, the Arjun. The Arjun is the first and only tank entirely designed and produced in India. While India did produce most of its T-72s and T-90s under a Russian license, Indian engineers relied on no outside help and after almost 30 years developed a heavily armored and modern tank of their own. The Arjun is by far the best tank that India can field. With a weight-to-power ratio of 24, the tank is adequately powered to be maneuverable on both road and off-road conditions. With its 120mm main gun, it can fire a wide range of rounds and its heaviest armor brings it to a weight of just under 60 tons fully combat loaded, with the newest variant weighing in at 67 tons, which is comparable to an American Abrams tank. This tank also has an active protection system, the only tank in India's arsenal to have this feature. Designed around detecting incoming electromagnetic signals from anti-tank guided missiles, the Arjun can then use jamming and smoke shells to defend against these threats. While certainly a leap in Indian armored technology, this capability would still be outclassed by more modern protection systems seen in Western countries or even Russia. Squaring off against India's tanks would be a wide variety of Chinese tanks. Outnumbering Indian tanks by about a thousand, the Chinese advantage in numbers doesn't give it much of an edge over India due to Chinese tanks having weaker engines, a lack of adequate protection systems, and no combat experience. The two mainstays of the Chinese armored force are the Type 96 and Type 99, 
numbering 2500 and 1200 respectively. These tanks make up the bulk of the armored force that would stream across the Indian frontier in the event of another Chinese invasion. As for the Type 96, the tank was born from a knee-jerk reaction by the Chinese military leadership. The Type 88 tank was largely based on legacy Soviet models, like the T-54-55 tanks. These tanks made up the bulk of Saddam's tank force during the Gulf War, and Chinese officials watched in horror as modern Western main battle tanks completely annihilated them. Because of this, the Type 96 was rushed through its development process. This resulted in the creation of an adequate enough tank that wasn't much better than its predecessor, the Type 88. Although it was slightly heavier and had better armor, it was severely underpowered. With just a measly 730 horsepower, later upgraded to 865, only the latest models have an engine that is not underpowered. With a power-to-weight ratio of about 18 for older models, the early Type 96 was much less maneuverable than its heavier Western counterparts. Additionally, the Chinese also implemented a similar active protection system to the one used on the Arjun, but stopped equipping their tanks with it when modern anti-tank missiles could defeat it. Because of this, a replacement for the Type 96 was needed almost as soon as it entered service. The next step was the Type 99. The Type 99 was a massive improvement over the Type 96. The Chinese army installed a 1500 horsepower twin turbo diesel engine to solve its chronic issues of being underpowered. Now with a power factor of about 27, the tank is on par with Western tanks in terms of maneuverability. The tank also got thicker armor that pushed its weight into the 50-ton range. However, its crown jewel was its active protection system. The Type 99 received an upgraded version of the Type 96's protection system, with improvements in both jamming and radar technology technology, but its most unique feature is the system's laser weapon. China claims that their APS systems use lasers to destroy incoming missiles. This claim, like most other Chinese military claims, have never been verified by independent observers. It's more likely that the Chinese use lasers to disrupt or confuse seekers on inbound missiles versus creating some death ray that explodes missiles on impact. While little is known about these systems, Western analysts have argued that the laser's effectiveness in low visibility situations, such as when operating in heavy smoke, fog, dust, and snow would be greatly limited. Because of this, the tank crew's best weapon would be the all-around radar that could detect incoming threats and alert the crew of a missile seeker. As far as comparing the two countries' tank forces, they're pretty evenly matched. As everyone is aware, the Russian use of T-72s in Ukraine has yet to work out well for them. This is because tanks like the T-72 are not much better than target practice on a modern battlefield without modern upgrades to sites, fire control computers, and active protection systems. It's unknown whether or not India has been upgrading their fleet of existing T-72s, and due to budget constraints, it's unlikely they've been outfitted with the most modern upgrades. Even so, we do know that they have made many upgrades to their T-90s by incorporating advanced gun sites, computers, and communications equipment from countries like Israel and France. These upgrades have made the Indian T-90 arguably better than the ones in Russian inventories. When comparing the two countries, the T-72 and Type 88, as well as the Type 99 and T-90, are evenly matched. India would have a slight edge in its newest Arjun tanks, but there are only two in service, and it would need many more to make a difference on the battlefield. Additionally, because the Chinese soldiers have better anti-tank weapons and the HJ-12, Indian armor would be in more danger than Chinese tanks. And as far as comparing air forces, the scale tip much more in favor of China. The core of India's Air Force comes in the form of its 173 MiG-21s and MiG-29 aircraft. Comprising the heart of its multi-role aircraft are the 272 Russian Su-30 Mark I aircraft. Opposing these Indian planes are just over 2,000 Chinese fighters and multi-role aircraft. The mainstay of the Chinese air arm would be the J-10 and J-11 aircraft, each with around 500 in surface. The MiG-21 and MiG-29s that India fields are quite old. Having been built in the 1960s and 70s, these planes are better suited for museums and modern airspaces. This is evidenced by a notable amount of crashes the Indian Air Force has suffered over the past several years, including one last year where two pilots died. The causes of the accidents have been kept a state secret, but it's likely because India's airframes are old and spare parts are hard to come by. In fact, by 2025, India will ground all its remaining MiG-21 aircraft, just over a hundred, and the MiG-29s will likely have to follow soon. This means that these airframes are likely in such bad shape they cannot continue flying routine training missions, much less continuous combat sorties. With 200 or so MiG fighters out of the question, India will have to rely heavily on its Su-30 aircraft in case of a war. While India has several newer aircraft models like the Dassault Mirage and Rafale, these number less than 100 total units. 
More than likely, the Indian Air Force would send its Su-30 aircraft to retake the skies over the northern frontier if tensions escalated to full-out war. Comparing the Su-30 to the J-10 and J-11 aircraft, we see the Su-30 is much heavier, about twice as heavy, but it's able to achieve slightly better speeds. The J-10 and J-11 were both leaps in Chinese aviation technology. While the J-11 is a domestically produced Su-27 built under license, the J-10 was domestically designed and produced. Both these aircraft can achieve faster speeds, higher service ceilings, and more maneuverability than any other Chinese aircraft produced before. However, in a dogfight, they would be at a slight disadvantage depending on where they were. Under normal conditions below 20,000 feet, the Su-30 would easily outgun them, since their radars and missiles can hit them further than their own organic sensors could track the Su-30. However, in altitudes above 20,000 feet, the Su-30 loses some of its maneuverability due to how heavy it is. In the case of the northern frontier, where altitudes are routinely 16,000 to 23,000 feet, all aircraft there would be flying near the ceiling of their operational endurance. Additionally, this does not take into the account numerous other aircraft the Chinese have in their inventories, such as the J-16 and X-H-7. The J-16 is one of the most modern aircraft the Chinese possess, with about 200 in service. The Chinese have a fourth-generation fighter that is stealthier, faster, and with more advanced avionics than the J-16. The aircraft is also equipped with electronic warfare packages that can suppress or destroy enemy air defenses, something that India only added to its inventory for the first time in 2020. Because of all this, the Indian Air Force would be at a severe disadvantage in any scenario against the Chinese Air Force. The Indian Air Force is both outgunned and outnumbered in almost every area, with them losing several hundred aging MiG fighters over the next several years. India would be hard-pressed to come up with a strategy to employ its fighter aircraft smartly. Perhaps in a scenario against China, India could take a page out of the Ukrainian playbook and move their aircraft around. They could have mobile air bases and store them in forested areas to prevent being seen taking off from highways. Because of the huge difference in the capability and numbers, the best the Indian Air Force could do is keep the skies contested. India simply does not have the means to gain strategic air superiority over the Chinese. While they could gain local air superiority in remote places like the northern frontier along the LAC, as an overall strategy, India would be focused on harassing and denying Chinese aircraft freedom of movement as much as possible. Due to the northern frontier and line of actual control being landlocked, the Navy would not play a part in these operations. With that in mind, let's first evaluate the most likely course of action before diving into the most dangerous course of action. Because of the extreme altitudes, any sort of mechanized warfare is basically out of the question. Sure, some light tanks and vehicles could get through, but their mobility would be limited. Additionally, resupplying in the mountains is notoriously tough. If not enough supplies are pre-positioned, getting enough fuel up there would be a struggle during wartime. As far as air superiority, though, China has many more aircraft. The extreme altitudes would mean all aircraft have to carry less fuel and ordnance than they normally would. The freezing temperatures and poor weather most of the year would undoubtedly affect flight time. Because of this, even if the Chinese gained air superiority, foul weather would likely negate most of the advantage, leaving their infantry formations exposed to Indian fire. Since the high mountains limit armored warfare and foul weather would limit aircraft sorties, the fight in the northern frontier would likely boil down to a light infantry and artillery duel. Because China has about twice the amount of artillery India possesses, it could in theory outgun Indian artillery. But again, the mountains come into play. Fighting in these extreme conditions would limit most types of radar. Modern artillery systems use radar to detect incoming rounds. This information is then used to direct fire missions to the location of enemy batteries. Because of the high elevations of these mountains, artillery crews would be very limited on when and where they could fire. Thus, an artillery fight in these conditions would probably involve a lot of direct line-of-sight shooting. That kind of fighting would come down to the individual crew's ability to load, sight, and fire their guns faster and better than the other side can. This would definitely level the playing field. Another factor that would level the playing field would be the Indian Army's actual combat experience. China has not fought in a conflict since its disastrous 1979 invasion of Vietnam. On the other hand, the Indian military is quite battle-hardened. From border skirmishes with Pakistani soldiers and Islamic militants in the northwest frontier to fighting several different guerrilla groups in northeastern India, the military has been engaged in fighting low-level insurgencies combined with flare-ups with Pakistan from time to time. Additionally, India has historically been one of the largest contributors of peacekeepers to UN missions. At any given year, on average, several thousand Indian soldiers are deployed to combat zones abroad. With that number in mind, there are likely 
tens of thousands of soldiers who have combat experience abroad still serving in the Indian Army, combined with the tens if not hundreds of thousands of troops who have experience serving in conflict zones internally, India has the upper hand in terms of combat experience. Because the Chinese troops lack this experience and the extreme environment negating many advantages in Chinese technology, Indian forces would likely have the edge as long as their command and control employed their infantry effectively. During the 1962 war, the Indians suffered heavy casualties because their generals did not want to give up any ground. This caused units to become isolated and surrounded as they were not allowed to retreat, and Chinese formations simply overwhelmed and wiped out these outposts. Modern Indian strategists suggest that in the event of another border war with China, Indian troops should have mountainsides and roads rigged with explosives. Doing this would slow down Chinese troop movements and could force them into prepared positions where Indian troops would have the advantage. However, this strategy hinges on the fact that Indian territory would have to be given up to bottleneck Chinese troops into these traps. Voluntarily allowing Indian territory to be surrendered is something that Delhi is not too keen on doing since any land occupied by China during the conflict is unlikely to be given up, as evidenced by the 1962 peace accords. In the case that the border war leads to a larger conflict, the conflict would likely be fought with naval, space, cyber, and missile assets, at least for the first stage. Theoretically speaking, the war aim of China would be to land an invasion force in India to take over a major population center. The Chinese Navy would be the star of the show for the first half of that fight. When comparing the two countries' navies, the Chinese Navy appears to have the advantage at first glance. Over the past 20 years, China has been on an aggressive campaign to modernize and strengthen its navy from a regional power that could only operate in the South China Sea to a navy that could operate in any waters around the planet. Part of this modernization has been the development of surface combatants and submarines. As far as surface combatants, the Chinese outnumbered the Indian Navy with 67 modern surface combatants against roughly 41 modern Indian combatants. The term modern typically means large surface combatants equipped with vertical launch systems, a combat system suite capable of launching modern missiles. When considering these numbers, China has about 26 Luyang's destroyers and 30 Zhangkai frigates. On the other hand, India can field just 24 destroyers and frigates of various types that have the same capability. The Luyang destroyers and Zhenkai frigates represent the best in Chinese naval advancements. These two ships can fire some of the most advanced missiles China has in its arsenal, including the much-feared YJ-62. These ships are, for all intents and purposes, China's attempt to copy the American Aegis combat system and the destroyers and cruisers that house them. Complementing the Chinese ships are their ability to operate with their own tactical data links, like the American Link-16. Tactical data links are huge in naval warfare, since if tracks and information cannot be shared securely between ships, it defeats the purpose of the extended range these combat suites provide. While these two ships represent the best in the Chinese surface fleet, it's what's beneath the waves that should scare India's leadership. The Chinese Navy fields the world's second most capable submarine force behind the US. While the Chinese field a variety of nuclear-powered submarines, their most fearsome is the Type 39A Yuan-class submarines. What makes these so special is the engineering plant inside of them. For decades, what's made nuclear-powered submarines better than traditional diesel-electric boats has been the fact that the nuclear-powered subs never had to surface. Unlike their nuclear counterparts, diesel-electric submarines have to surface to recharge their batteries, making the vessel vulnerable to attack from surface ships and aircraft. For decades, countries have been trying to create a reliable engineering plant where diesel submarines would not have to surface. Known as Air Independent Propulsion, or AIP, about 10 countries have figured out how to create this type of engineering plant as of today. However, there's much variation in the effectiveness of these plants, with China claiming that they made the best AIP engineering configuration to date. There's still a huge debate in the naval community on whether diesel or nuclear submarines are harder to detect. Each one has its own pros and cons. However, the fact that China has developed arguably the quietest diesel submarines on the planet is not good news for India. But despite all this, India is not totally defenseless against the Chinese Navy. Standing against the Chinese Navy are several dozen modern frigates and destroyers. The combat capabilities are pretty similar to their Chinese counterparts, with one major exception. Indian naval vessels are armed with the fastest cruise missile in any nation's inventory. The missile is called the BrahMos and was made in conjunction with Russian engineers throughout the early to mid-2000s. The end result has been truly extraordinary. The missile can be outfitted to ships, aircraft, and submarines. It cruises around Mach 1, then transitions to an eye-popping Mach 3 for its terminal phase of flight. 
The missile also has the sea skimming capability of staying about 10 feet off the surface of the ocean. India classifies the missile's flight paths, but it's likely it has a wide range of flight paths, including a high diving path to defeat most modern combat system suites. The missile also has an extreme range of about 500 kilometers, or 270 nautical miles. This is important because this is just beyond the max effective range of the Chinese YJ-62 of 400 kilometers, or 250 nautical miles. But despite this advantage, in overall terms of ballistic and cruise missiles, China is the clear winner. China is bar none the most prolific producer of cruise and ballistic missiles in the world. With thousands of missiles of dozens of types, the Chinese have made missile technology a mainstay in their arsenal. The primary reason for this has been to keep the American Navy away from the South China Sea by blanketing the area with extended range munitions since its surface forces could not go toe to toe in a fight with the US. China could leverage these long range weapons in a war with India by using them to pummel strategic sites well out of reach of Indian threats. According to maps released by the Office of Naval Intelligence, China can send thousands of missiles against targets across the Indo Pacific region. In the 1,000 km to 5,000 km range that encompasses most of India, China could send hundreds of missiles into Indian territory with little fear of counterfire. Another way they could attack Indian targets is through their extensive cyber warfare arm. According to a study released in 2021, China is number two in the world in terms of cyber warfare capability, with India coming in at number 12. But how could this be when India produces the most college graduates in the field of information technology and cyber in the world? The main reason has been priorities. Before about 2015, India was content with just being a regional power. However, their fear of China has made the country's politicians envision India being a peer with China. Part of being a peer is having a strong military, so they do not get bullied by Chinese tactics that they have used on similar nations. Because of this, India began an aggressive Made in India campaign to produce all types of weapon systems domestically. This is why so many of the newest Indian defense technologies have rolled out over the past several years or are still in development. Cyber warfare was one of those areas. India's cyber economy is amongst the strongest in the world. However, for years the private sector has been under attack from a virtual onslaught of ransomware and cyber attacks both from criminal groups and nation-state actors like North Korea. Because of this, Indian society has now hardened its networks to be amongst the strongest in the world. All citizens virtually require two-factor authentication for every website and app imaginable. This same mentality has spread to its military as well. However, India's cyber warfare arm is still in development. Because the superpower has never needed this capability before, they've been working with the US and other Western countries to help them develop their capabilities. China, on the other hand, has the world's largest, albeit low-tech, offensive cyber arm. Estimates vary, but a ballpark range of 100,000 cyber warriors spread among military and criminal groups that the Chinese government directly controls is a generally accepted number. It's a fact that India is the most prolific cyber attacker in the world, however their methods tend to not be very sophisticated. For example, the vast majority of thwarted cyber attacks are actually traced to Chinese government sources. Though China has carried out some exceptionally successful cyber operations in recent years, these can all be attributed to the sheer volume of attacks conducted and to getting lucky. The best way to describe China's cyber warfare capabilities is through saying, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Countries like the US would exploit one glaring vulnerability without ever being detected, while China would try every way of infiltrating while hoping one works. China would certainly beat India regarding its offensive cyber operations. Still, because India has been hardening its networks, it's unclear how much damage the Chinese military could really inflict. Further compounding China's problems is the fact that it still lacks a significant amphibious capability. Currently, China's amphibious assault fleet is inadequate for an attack on Taiwan, an island just off China's coast. And just to attempt it, China would have to conscript hundreds of civilian vessels. An attack into the Indian Ocean would be suicide for China. While China couldn't realistically threaten India with its naval forces, India meanwhile sits on China's trade jugular. With much of China's oil imports passing through the Indian Ocean, India's navy could, with ease, cut China off from this badly needed supply. This would leave China with only fuel imports from Russia, which would barely be enough to run its military. The civilian sector would suffer from dramatic fuel shortages and its economy would tank as a result. But if for some reason China could land an invasion force in India successfully, the fight would still not be finished. China hasn't had the experience of fighting a war on foreign soil in a long time. Keeping their military supplied would be a challenge unless Chinese troops completely overrun the northern frontier areas. So in order for India to win in a peer-to-peer -peer war with China, they would need to hold their northern and eastern frontier
frontiers against China while also inflicting significant losses on the Chinese Navy. Suppose the Chinese Navy remains relatively intact and Chinese forces conduct a successful two-pronged invasion from the north and from the sea. In that case, India would likely be outgunned and outproduced in the long run, since China remains the world's number one manufacturer and number two economy. China and its military have been all over the news recently. Should we be scared of their power or is it all propaganda? We're going to discover that and more in this overlook of China's military. The Chinese military forces, known as the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, and its naval component, the PLAN, have always stressed numbers over quality. Beginning in 1949, the Chinese strategy of warfare, as articulated by their leader Mao Zedong, emphasized the superiority of man over weapons. Although weapons were certainly a significant component of winning any battle, Mao was quoted as saying, they were not the decisive factor. It's people, not things, that are decisive. The contest of strength is not only a contest of military and economic power, but also a contest of human power and morale. To Mao, non-material factors like creativity, flexibility, and high morale were also critical determinants in warfare. Of course, he made those comments when China was still hobbled by an agrarian economy and long before they had the technology and resources to combat the United States and other Western powers on an equal material footing. In more recent times, China's made an effort to increase not just its overall numbers of advanced weapons like tanks, missiles, ships, and aircraft, but to improve their quality as well. Nowhere is that effort for improvement more noticeable than in the People's Liberation Army Navy or PLAN, which is undergoing a historic increase in shipbuilding and associated warfare capabilities. Rear Admiral Michael Studeman, commander of the Office of Naval Intelligence, was quoted in January 2023 as saying the PLAN is involved in a buildup in every warfare area, from its nascent space force and cyber warfare efforts to a fully capable blue water navy. We'll see more of the Chinese Navy in the future, he said, as it operates farther from its home ports and its normal regional interests, specifically the South China Sea. China is expanding its logistics networks across the globe via port access agreements, formal basing arrangements, and takeovers of ports and nations that defaulted on infrastructure loans with China. But more importantly, the PLAN is increasing the size of its blue water fleet at a rapid pace. Here's what they have in service as of early 2023 with an outlook on what they're building for the future. Current Strengths of the PLAN the U.S. Defense Department is forecasting an increase in the PLAN from around 340 ships in 2023 to almost 500 by 2035. In 2021 alone, the PLAN launched a total of 21 ships, while the U.S. Navy commissioned just seven. The question is, does China have enough ships right now to confront the U.S. Navy and its allies in the Western Pacific and when, or would they be better off waiting a few years or even a decade in order to have a more overwhelming advantage? Let's take a look at what we know of current numbers of PLAN ships and assets. Aircraft Carriers 3. The pride of any modern navy and the ship around which most current fleets are built is the supercarrier. China's been a late comer to this party, but they're making up for it in a big way. They're currently operating three carriers, the 1990s era Type 001 Liaoning, relegated to mostly a training role, the Type 002 Shandong, and the recently launched Type 003 Fujian. The Type 001 and 002 are almost identical and both include a ski jump launch ramp which is replaced on the Type 003 with an electromagnetic catapult launcher. Types 1 and 2 are both in the 60 to 70,000 ton range, while Type 3 is expected to displace between 85,000 and 90,000 tons. These carriers are equipped mostly with the J-15 Flying Shark Naval Fighter, which we'll discuss later. The Type 1 and 2 can carry between 40 and 45 fighter aircraft and helicopters, while the larger Type 3 is expected to have a complement of up to 60 total aircraft. In comparison, the U.S. Ford-class carrier, the U.S. Navy's most modern carrier, has a complement of up to 85 aircraft and displaces around 100,000 tons. In 2021, analysts reported that the Type 3 will operate the Shenyang J-15B variant, a modernized version of the J-15 that will feature catapult launch capability, modern fifth-generation avionics, active electronically scanned array radar, new airframes, stealth coatings, and new engines with possible thrust vectoring capability. This aircraft is expected to be a stopgap aircraft until the scheduled PLAN stealth carrier fighter is developed and produced. More on that later as well. There's much discussion about a proposed fourth PLAN aircraft carrier currently under development and known only as the Type 04. Unfortunately, not many concrete details are known about this ship. Its debut will not be seen until 2024 at the earliest and possibly not till 2025. It's rumored to have an electromagnetic launch capability like the U.S. Navy Ford-class carriers and might be nuclear-powered as well, though again, nothing's been confirmed. 
It's interesting to note that the early models and paintings of the Type 004 bear an ID number of 20, while Type 003, just entering service, bears the ID number of 18. This suggests there might be another carrier in the planning stages, probably a sister ship to the Type 003, which could presumably bear the ID number 19. Landing Helicopter Docks 3. One of the areas the Chinese government has addressed as a pressing issue is the PLAN's ability to land troops during an amphibious operation, such as the possible invasion of Taiwan. They have therefore placed a strong emphasis on modernizing and increasing the size of their amphibious assault forces. The largest of these vessels are currently the three Type 075 Landing Helicopter Docks, or LHD, very large ships at between 30,000 and 40,000 tons. Their size allows them to operate almost as escort carriers, with a flight deck that allows for seven takeoff and landing spots, with two elevators for moving helicopters from below deck. They can carry three Type 726 Yugi class LCAC hovercraft, which can be launched from a floodable well dock. The LHDs also carry up to 60 armored fighting vehicles and between 700 and 800 troops. These LHDs are modern ships built since 2018, with an estimated eight more expected to be completed in the next 10 years. Their one limiting factor is that as of 2023, China does not operate a vertical takeoff and landing or VTOL aircraft like the US's F-35B, so the LHDs are limited to rotary aircraft only. Amphibious Transport Docks 8. While the LHDs are expected to be the backbone of any future amphibious attack, the eight Type 071 Amphibious Transport Docks, or ATDs, will no doubt be used as well. Smaller than the LHDs, but still impressive at 25,000 tons displacement, these ships don't have a flight deck, but they do have a stern landing deck for two Z-8 transport helicopters and room on board for up to four more. The ATDs also have a floodable well deck for up to four Type 726 hovercraft and can carry the same number of armored vehicles, up to 60, and more troops, up to 800, than the LHDs. The Type 71 can also carry landing craft on port and starboard davits. And while both the Type 75 and Type 71 ships have limited SAM launchers for self-defense, they'll need protection from other ships in any fleet action where an amphibious operation is expected to be opposed. Landing Ship Tanks 36 Weighing in at around 4,000 tons, the PLAN also operates some 36 medium-sized landing ship tanks. Each of these can carry up to 250 troops and between 10 to 12 combat vehicles, which can be offloaded through their bow doors or via a stern ramp. Every modern carrier-based fleet needs protection from missiles and attacking aircraft. This role in modern fleets is served by the more modern multi-role missile-carrying destroyers. In the PLAN, there are generally three levels of capability for their destroyer fleet. Type 055, Renhai class ships, 8. The best of their destroyers are the eight commissioned Type 055 Renhai class ships that displace about 13,000 tons. Very large for a destroyer and almost the size of a World War II heavy cruiser. In comparison, Germany's World War II heavy cruiser, the Admiral Hipper, was only slightly larger at 14,000 tons displacement. The Type 55 is inherently stealthy and boasts a massive complement of 112 vertical launch systems, or VLS, that can handle HHQ-9 surface-to-air missiles with a range of between 120 and 250 kilometers, YJ-18 anti-ship missiles with a range of 220 to 540 kilometers, YJ-21 anti-ship missiles, a reported 1,500-km range, CJ-10 land attack missiles over 1,500km of range, and various missile-launched anti-submarine torpedoes. These destroyers are some of the best in the world, and their striking power is unmatched by any other ship of its size. The Zumwalt-class destroyers, while even larger than the Type 55s, displacing 15,900 tons, only carry 80 VLRS tubes. Another 12 to 15 Type 55s are in various stages of planning or building, with one or two new ships expected to be launched each of the next five or six years. It's noteworthy that the PLN was able to launch all eight of their current Type 55s in only three years, from 2017 to 2020. As an aside, the U.S. classifies these ships as cruisers, which are defined by the U.S. Navy as large multi-mission surface combatants with flag facilities. This suggests the U.S. expects the Type 55 to fulfill a similar role as the Ticonderoga-class cruiser. Type 052D, Luyang 3 class, 26. Almost as capable are the smaller 26 vessels of the Type 52D Luyang 3 class. With its 7,500 ton displacement, it is a larger variant of the Type 52C. The Type 52D was China's first dedicated multi-role destroyer, 
as it oversaw the switch from swing arm launchers to the vertical launch tube array. The Type 52D has a more modest 64 tubes. The Type 52D also employs the same flat-paneled active electronically scanned array radar that the Type 55 uses. Unlike the Type 55s, though, their missile complement includes the earlier version of the HHQ-9 air defense missile with a shorter 120km range the earlier YJ-18 anti-ship missile with a 220km range and the CY-5 anti-submarine missiles. Despite being based on earlier designs and smaller than the Type 55s, these ships are still quite modern and more capable of handling air and missile defense over quite a large area. Another six are being built, though from that point on it's expected that the Type 55 will do the heavy lifting when it comes to air defense for the PLAN. Type 052C Luyang-2 Class 6 the second level of battle-worthy destroyers would include the six Type 052C Luyang-2 class destroyers, launched in 2004 and 2006, and the two Type 51C Luzhou class ships launched beginning in 2006. The Type 52C, displacing 7,000 tons, was the first PLAN vessel that included both a fixed active electronically scanned array radar as well as vertically launched surface-to-air missiles, making it the first Chinese warship with area-wide air defense capability. Its launch system includes a standard complement of 48 HHQ-9 surface-to-air missiles with a range of 120 kilometers that are cold-launched from eight revolver-type vertical launchers with six missiles per launcher, along with eight tube-launched YJ-62 anti-ship cruise missiles with a range of 280 kilometers. Because of this earlier launch system, these ships could be overwhelmed by a mass attack of modern hypersonic or sea-skimming missiles. No additional Type 55C or 51C destroyers are currently being built. Type 51C Luzhou Class 2 the two Type 51C destroyers at 7,100 tons lack the stealthier radar cross-section found on the newer Chinese warships and possess a less advanced steam turbine propulsion compared to the gas turbine propulsion present in all newer Chinese destroyers. The Type 51C was considered a temporary answer for a long-range area air defense platform that blended the proven hull design of the Type 51 with the existing SAM systems that were deemed capable for fleet defense. Production of this class ended once the more advanced Type 52C destroyers became available. Type 52B Luyang-1 Class 2 Russian-built Sovremeni Class 4 Type 51B Luhai Class 1 Type 52 Luhu Class 2 The least battle-worthy of the PLAN destroyers includes the last remaining commissioned vessels in several classes, two Type 52B Luyang-1 Class, four Russian-built Sovremeni Class, one Type 51B Luhai class and two Type 52 Luhu class. These are expected to either be relegated to China's equivalent of the Coast Guard or mothballed as more of the larger Type 55s come online. Frigates 47 Frigates are considered escort vessels that are smaller than the current PLA and destroyer class of ships. These include several varieties. The 32 Type 54A Zheng Kai 2 class at 3,960 tons displacement, the 2 Type 54 Zheng Kai 1 vessels, 3,900 tons displacement, the 10 Type 53 H3 Zheng Y 2, 2,200 tons displacement, and the 3 Type 53 Zheng Hu class, 2,000 tons displacement. Type 54A Zheng Kai 2 class, 32. Of these, the Type 54As are the most lethal, with a 32-cell VLS system armed with HQ-16 missiles with a 40-kilometer range. While not armed with the longer-range SAMs that larger ships have, they can supplement the overall air defense system, while also being useful submarine hunters with their Type 87 anti-submarine rocket launcher with 36 rockets carried and its three U-8 ASW torpedo launchers. Their SAM missiles, however, are really only useful for self-defense, not as part of an area air defense system, and their sonars are relatively short-ranged. There are current plans to build as many as 30 more of these relatively inexpensive Type 54s, though, through 2035. Type 54 Junkai 1 Class 2 the Type 54 Junkai 1 class was designed in the 1990s and built into 2005. Though older, they do include features like stealthy hull designs and the YJ-83 sea skimming anti-ship missiles with a 180km range. Though they're launched in an 8-cell launcher with 16 additional missiles stored in their automatic loaders. Type 53 H3 Zheng Y2 10 The Type 53 Zheng Hu class 3 the Type 53 Zheng Hu class were also armed with the YJ-83 missile in two four-cell launchers, along with the HQ-61 surface-to-air missiles with an 18-kilometer range. These and the Type 54 have already seen many of their sister ships transferred to China's Coast Guard or sold overseas, and these will likely accompany them in due time. Corvettes 72 The smallest of the PLAN's intended Blue Ocean fleet are the Corvettes. 
Type 56A, 50. 50 of these are the Type 56A guided missile corvettes with 1,500 tons displacement, which began production in 2013 and are of a relatively new design and are equipped with both an active sonar and a towed array sonar, which is uncommon for ships this small. They incorporate modest stealth superstructures and are armed with four YJ-83 anti-ship missiles and two triple tube 324mm torpedo launchers, which might carry U-7 light ASWs. Type 56 class, 22. The Type 56A class are supported by 22 earlier Type 56 class corvettes. These ships are less useful to the Blue Water Fleet due to more limited fuel and ammunition supplies, but they are equipped with both a hull mounted sonar and a single ASW helicopter. Both types are expected to stay mostly close to shore and provide coastal and port security and defense, and might also wind up in the Chinese Coast Guard along with the aforementioned frigates. Missile Boats 106. The smallest ships of the PLAN that'll still pack an offensive punch are the missile boats. Small and fast, though not very survivable in dedicated shooting wars, they're expected to operate much like the famous PT boats of World War II. Get in, fire their armament, and then get away even faster. Type 22, 82. Though small in size at 224 tons, the 82 Type 22 fast missile boats are an ingenious solution that the PLAN began to deploy in 2004. These craft are designed to patrol China's coastal areas and operate within its littoral zone. However, as each of the Type 22s is armed with eight YJ-83 anti-ship missiles, it's speculated by some observers that a large number of the craft firing in salvos could potentially overwhelm an enemy fleet, including an aircraft carrier battle group. The design is based on an Australian catamaran craft that provides a more stable launch platform than other ships of its size, especially in the high seas. All 82 of these ships were launched between 2004 and 2011, though no additional ships of this class are pending. Type 37-2 6 The PLAN also operates six Type 37-2 corvettes weighing in at about 420 tons. These anti-submarine shallow water patrol craft were built between 1964 and 1982, so they're far from state-of-the-art. As newer models of Corvettes have entered service, these ships have been phased out or put into storage. Type 37 IG 18 That's much of the same fate as the 18 Type 37 IG Corvettes, built between 91 and 1999. The IG is an anti-ship version of the Type 37 and are equipped with a small complement of four C-801, 802, 803 anti-ship missiles, effectively the same missile as the YJ-83 with a range of about 120 kilometers. Rounding out their surface fleet, the PLAN also have 26 smaller sub-chasers and 36 minesweepers. These won't be part of any nominal blue water fleet, unless they're transitioning to protect some other more distant coastal or port areas. Type 94 Jin-class Ballistic Missile Submarines 7. The exact number of active submarines in the PLAN is a state secret, so the numbers listed here are best estimates by various analysts and Western sources. The most dangerous are the PLAN-7 Jin-class ballistic missile submarines (SSBNs). These boats were considered by the US DOD as China's first credible seaborne nuclear deterrent. Their weapon systems originally carried 12 single warhead JL-2 SLBMs with a 7200 km range. These have mostly been replaced by the JL-3 SLBMs with a range of over 10,000 km, which gives the Jin the ability to reach the continental US. The PLN has boasted through numerous improvements that the boats are now currently as quiet as the US's improved Los Angeles class, but in 2009 the US Navy's Office of Naval Intelligence reported that the Shangs were about as noisy as the Russian Victor III class submarine which entered service in 1979. Six of these have been built and another two upgraded models are still being built. The Type 94 succeeded the Type 92's SSBNs and will in turn be replaced by the Type 96 sub which is under development and expected to come online starting in the mid 2020s. Type 93 Shang class nuclear powered attack submarines. 6. The PLAN also operates six Shang class nuclear powered attack submarines. As with the Type 94, the PLAN believes they are as quiet as some of the best US Navy attack ships, though ONI reports they're about as noisy as late 70s Russian era ships. This will hinder them in attacking US assets, which might not be as much of a problem when encountering ships from India and maybe Japan. They're armed with six torpedo tubes and can launch a range of weapons, including the U 3, the first indigenous Chinese torpedo with a range of 13.3 kilometers, the U 4 with a 15 kilometer range, and the U 6 torpedoes with a 46 kilometer range, as well as the YJ 82 anti ship cruise missiles with less than a 42 kilometer range. Type 39A, also called the Type 41 Yuan class, 17. 
China possesses 17 Yuan-class Diesel Electric Attack Subs SSKs. These are the plant's first air-independent propulsion or AIP-powered subs, making them some of the quietest diesel electric subs in any Navy. While at first considered by the US Navy as an anti-ship cruise missile platform capable of remaining submerged for lengthy periods of time in difficult-to-acquire coastal areas, it's since been expected to take on the role of a traditional blue-water attack submarine. Kilo Class 10 China originally purchased 12 Russian-origin Kilo-class submarines, two Project 877 vessels, two Project 636 vessels, and eight Project 636M vessels. In late 2021, the PLAN retired the two Project 877 vessels, leaving 10 Russian-origin Kilo-class subs in service. Type 39 Song-class 13 China possesses 13 Song-class diesel-electric attack submarines. Not as quiet nor as fast as their upgraded Type 39A or Type 41 cousins, these are considered more coastal protection and less useful for long-term employments. Type 35 Ming-class 22 China possesses 22 Ming-class diesel-electric attack submarines. While the early models, Type 35s, were deemed acceptable when they were first designed in the early 1980s, over the decades since their inception, many improvements were deemed necessary. Many variants have been developed since then, such as the Type 35A with 6 built, the Type 35G with 12 built, and the Type 35B with 4 built. All Ming-class submarines possess 533mm torpedo tubes, and Type 35Bs are capable of firing cruise missiles from their torpedo tubes. Not if the PLAN will attack, but when? President Xi has already stated he wants the Chinese military to be prepared to retake Taiwan by force no later than 2027, which just so happens to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Liberation Army. By that time, it'll have added hundreds of new missiles, a dozen more advanced destroyers, and a couple more nuclear attack subs, and might even have come close to addressing its carrier aviation woes. Xi's also called for the military to achieve world-class status by 2049, suggesting the ability to dominate the Western Pacific despite any effort by the US Navy and its allies Japan, Australia, and possibly India. It's clear China's already preparing for an invasion of Taiwan, as its most recent exercise in April 2023 codenamed Joint Sword demonstrated. The three-day event included 80 fixed-wing and 40 rotary craft helicopter sorties from the Type 2 Shandong carrier as well as simulated attack drills using aircraft armed with live weapons. The exercise was a coordinated effort designed for a large-scale attack on Taiwan, though the effort was somewhat limited in scope. The PLAN only deployed one carrier, the Shandong, 11 other warships, and 91 aircraft, with the majority of the aircraft being land-based types. These included Su-30 fighters and H-6 bombers, as well as carrier-based J-11s and J-15s. Official Chinese outlets admitted the aircraft involved carried live ammunition and practiced multiple waves of simulated strikes on important targets, both on the island of Taiwan as well as supposed naval threats. Following the conclusion of the three-day operation, the PLA's Eastern Theater Command said in a statement, the troops in the theater are ready to fight all the time and can fight at any time, resolutely crushing any form of Taiwan independence, separatism, and foreign interference. While this is not the largest naval exercise that the PLAN has carried out, those that followed the Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in August 2022 included 13 warships and 68 planes, as well as live-fire ballistic missile launches. It's the first where the PLAN simulated a blockade of the entire island, and the first that involved one of its two frontline carriers. Taiwan's radar showed four J-15 fighter jets to the island's east, demonstrating that the PLAN is for the first time simulating attacking from the east, rather than only from the west where China's mainland lies. All its previous military exercises involved only a show of force in the western strait of Taiwan. Analysts also said it was likely the J-15 fighters had come from the Shandong aircraft carrier, one of the two frontline carriers China is currently operating, while their third carrier, the recently launched Type-003, named the Fujian, undergoes sea trials. During the operation, the Shandong was deployed in the western Pacific Ocean, roughly 200 miles southeast of Taiwan. It should be noted that through the years, other countries have launched invasions under the guise of exercises and drills, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's very likely any real invasion of Taiwan may begin using the same ruse. One element suggesting a sooner rather than later war might be the drawdown of US and other Western countries' stockpiles of missiles, ammunition, and artillery which has resulted from them supplying these resources to Ukraine. Estimates are that Ukraine is burning through an estimated 6,000 artillery shells per day. The stockpiles the West and the US have relied on to keep Ukraine supplied can't be replaced as quickly as they're being expended. The return of stockpiles to pre-invasion levels could take years to accomplish. 
A recent war simulation between the US and China over the island of Taiwan, run by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, concluded the US could run out of some munitions in as little as a week. Current efforts are being made to strengthen supply chains and make it easier for private US companies to ramp up production in the event of a war, but these changes could also take years to implement. These problems are particularly concerning since the rate at which China has been acquiring high-end weapon systems and equipment is five to six times faster than the US, according to some US government estimates. Overall, the Pentagon hopes to increase artillery ammunition production five-fold in the next two years, the largest production increase since the mid-1950s and the Korean War. This would include both rockets and conventional shells, and it'd be understandable if China also had reached the same conclusion and decides to take on the US armed forces before they address these shortcomings and adapt overall production infrastructure to correct the shortfalls. The US has made it clear that its military is anticipating and prepping for a future conflict centered around defeating or at least containing Chinese military aggression. Not only is the US working to increase the number of bases it has access to in the Western Pacific, it's also begun to change its force structure to better fit the amphibious warfare expected in such a scenario. For example, the US Marine Corps is undergoing a once-in-a-generation restructuring of their forces, ditching heavy equipment like tanks in favor of more mobile strike forces that can be deployed from littoral combat ships and helicopter assets. China is undoubtedly aware of this and has to gauge whether they should strike before the US fully implements this changeover in planning, logistics, and tactics, dubbed Force Design 2030. Then there are the estimates that China's population is shrinking, an unsettling proposition that the country has tried to conceal. For the first time since the famines of Mao's Great Leap Forward in 1961, China's population dropped in 2022, losing an officially estimated 850,000 people from its count though the actual number might be even higher than the Chinese government is willing to admit. Not only is China's population dropping, but their population pyramid is upside down. China is failing to replace its aging population with sufficient numbers of younger men and women that are needed both in working roles as well as the military. The longer China waits, the smaller its manpower pool from which it draws on prospective soldiers, sailors, and pilots will be. Besides the focus on Taiwan, there are other flashpoints across the Western Pacific, such as the areas of the South China Sea, that China, through building bases on atolls and reefs, claims as their sovereign territory. While their right to own such areas has been denied by the United Nations, China holds firm to their perceived right and continues to engage in heated exchanges whenever the US or another regional power attempts to sail through such areas. The most recent near altercation came in April 2023, when the Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyer USS Milius performed formed a freedom of navigation operation, FONOP, in the South China Sea near the Spratly Islands area called Mischief Reef, an aptly named site for an accidental launch of a world war if there ever was one. Events like Taiwan invasion exercises and the ongoing incidents over the contested portions of the South China Sea support the concern that an unplanned incident could launch an unexpected conflict at any moment. Some Chinese leaders might believe they'd be better off striking sooner than later, even if the alternative would mean the PLAN would be larger and more robust just a few years from now. But that last point might be the most compelling reason why China might just wait before it launches an overt attack. Why would they wait? Many elements of the PLAN's modernization won't come online until 5 to 10 years from now, including its most advanced aircraft carrier, the Type 004, which remains a mystery for the most part. It's not clear what stage of development it's in. It's not even clear whether it'll make use of advanced nuclear propulsion systems like the 11 current US carriers. According to many observers, China's naval nuclear reactor technology is not advanced enough to support a warship the size of the Type 004. This matters a great deal, because nuclear propulsion would allow the ship to sail farther without refueling, only needing to be resupplied with provisions for the crew as well as ammunition and other expendables for its combat assets. A nuclear propulsion unit would also provide more energy to run the advanced electromagnetic launch systems and advanced Aegis-type radar and other sensor suites as well as future weapon add-ons like railguns and directed energy weapons. It should be noted that the USS Gerald Ford is designed around not just one but two powerful nuclear propulsion systems, as will all future Ford-class supercarriers. This provides an excess of power for future improvements during an anticipated 50-year lifespan for the Ford-class carriers and allows for several refits and upgrades. Some observers have noted that the current ID number attached to the Type 004 is 20, while the Type 003 is 18. 
That gap has led to speculation that China is planning a second Type 003 carrier, a sister ship to the Shandong, which could carry the ID-19 and which would be cheaper and quicker to build than the groundbreaking Type 4. This has led to estimates that the PLAN could field five modern aircraft carriers by 2030, including the Type 004 and the Type 003 sister ship, as well as a total of 10 ballistic missile subs, an increase over its current six. But by 2030, the U.S. should have an additional two Ford-class carriers as well, each of which are larger than the planned Type 004 carrier at 80,000 tons versus the Ford-class carrier's 100,000 tons. The Ford-class carriers will also field up to 85 aircraft, while the Type 004s will possibly carry 45 to 60 aircraft. Another area where the PLAN legs behind the U.S. is in trained carrier pilots. It's no secret the Chinese Navy has had trouble fielding an adequate carrier aircraft trainer. Its current option, the JL-9G, a single-engine twin-seat aircraft first deployed in 2011, is based on a design that's too weak to take the continued pounding that carrier landings place on an aircraft's body, so it's been limited to only simulated carrier landings and takeoffs on ground-based mock-ups. And as any carrier pilot will tell you, the most difficult part of being a carrier-based pilot is trying to land on an airplane on a short diagonal runway of a ship that's moving away from you, often at night and sometimes in rough seas. Ground-based mock-ups would not sufficiently be an accurate simulation for the intensity and difficulty of a true carrier landing. There are concurrent problems with its standard carrier fighter, the J-15 Flying Shark, which was mocked by Russia as a poorly back-engineered version of a 2001 Su-33 prototype, the T-10K-3, which they had bought from Ukraine. At a reported 17.5 tons, the J-15 is now thought to be the world's heaviest carrier-borne fighter. In comparison, the U.S. Navy's F-A-18 weighs only 14.5 tons, and the F-35C Lightning II is only slightly more at 14.6 tons. The J-15 suffers from either having to carry less than optimal fuel, giving it less range, or less armament, giving it less lethality, if it intends to take off from the two Type 1 and Type 2 ski jump equipped carriers. With a pair of Chinese-designed engines that fail to produce adequate thrust to weight ratios, its underwhelming performance has earned it the nickname of the flopping fish by the normally reserved Chinese press. On the plus side, China's begun deployment of the Chengdu J-20 stealth fighter, somewhat comparable to the US's F-22 stealth fighter, and have produced and put into service around 200 of them. But this aircraft cannot be adapted to carriers much like the F-22, and remains a standard land-based air superiority fighter, which limits their range and thus their support of the PLAN. China is, however, focused on creating a new carrier launch stealth fighter, the FC-31 Jirfalcon, also known as the J-31, a mid-sized twin-jet fifth-generation fighter aircraft currently in its design and development stages. And though a prototype was spotted going through testing as early as July 2022, a completed and fully functional aircraft might not be deployed until sometime after 2025. No country is standing still. No military force exists in a vacuum. The strength of China's PLAN can only be measured against its likely opponents, and it's clear the longer China waits, the more of its military assets will be coming online. Yet, as they wait to increase their naval strength, the countries surrounding them are doing the same. Their current chief rival, the U.S. Navy, has plans to expand their 300-ship fleet to a massive 500-ship fleet by 2045. While the PLAN is expected to launch more larger ships, the U.S. is doing the opposite, focusing on many smaller ships to spread out its attack posture across a wider number of platforms. Then, of course, there is Taiwan. They've increased their military spending by 14% to a record $19 billion for the fiscal year 2023. Despite such massive increases, they've also asked the United States for an additional $19 billion in military aid, which Congress previously approved in November 2022, though various delays have prevented the aid from reaching Taiwan just yet. Not far behind is Japan, who have just completed two new 27,000-ton Izumo-class carriers. They can accommodate up to seven SH-60K ASW helicopters and seven MCM-100 mine countermeasure helicopters, along with 400 troops. They're also expected to accommodate both the F-35B, a VSTOL version of the F-35, along with USMV-22 Ospreys for an anticipated future amphibious counter-strike mission. In addition to Japan's first carrier since World War II, their navy is also committed to building two Aegis-equipped destroyers of around 20,000 tons, making them larger than the U.S.'s 15,900-ton Zumwalt destroyers. These are clearly cruisers in everything but name. China has nothing of a comparable size in the PLAN, nor in development. Japan also operates the Maya-class destroyers with a more normal displacement of 8,200 tons, in coordination with two older Atago-class and four Kong-class destroyers. 
Just to the south, a three-way deal is already underway between Australia, the United States, and Great Britain, where Australia will allow the basing of a small number of US and UK nuclear submarines in the port city of Perth in Western Australia, beginning in 2027. Following this move, the Australian government will purchase three US-made Virginia-class nuclear cruise missile fast attack subs in the early 2030s. From that point on, Australia and the UK will coordinate in designing and building an all-new, jointly designed fast attack nuclear submarine currently identified as the SSN AUKUS, using technology from all three countries. India has also added a new carrier to its fleet, the 40,000-ton Vikrant, the first and certainly not the last wholly indigenous carrier designed and built in India. The ship can carry up to 26 fighters like the MiG-29K or the Rafale M, along with four helicopters like the Ka-31. There are rumors that India wishes to build a sister ship to the Vikrant, but nothing has yet been confirmed. As an addendum, India has also begun to replace China as one of the go-to sources of high-tech manufacturing. Apple Inc. recently announced that India has assembled more than $7 billion worth of iPhones in the fiscal year ending 2022, signaling Apple and other high-tech companies' moves beyond China. This decision to seek new manufacturing partners other than China is one that will only increase, not decrease, in the coming years. These partnerships will help India to expand its homegrown manufacturing base, draining both capital and brain power from China's tech sector. While China is pouring money and resources into modernizing the PLAN, its efforts have been matched by other nations around the region who feel threatened by China's bellicose nature toward Taiwan, as well as its attempts to grab 90% of the South China Sea for itself. At some point, China will have to decide if a continued buildup in parallel with its neighbors is the best solution to dominate the world's ocean, or if they'll decide to go all in with what they have. One thing is certain, the US and its allies must respect the striking power of China's current fleet while awaiting a second Pearl Harbor-like strike. Hopefully this time, the US Navy will heed the warnings of the massive buildup by a potential Pacific opponent. The new submarine alliance between the United States, the UK, and Australia could be the most aggressive and devastating move against China that has ever been conceived. As the West tries to maintain dominance around the world, these three nations have decided to take things to another level. We're going to tell you why an ally and member of NATO was stabbed in the back, how the United States exploited a loophole in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and whether this new nuclear sub-agreement could spark World War III. On March 13, 2023, President Biden of the United States, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese of Australia, and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of the United Kingdom spoke at Point Loma Naval Base in San Diego. It was here that one of China's worst nightmares manifested. The three nations laid out plans to deliver nuclear-powered submarines to Australia in the coming years. This obviously worries China because it would threaten its position in the Indo-Pacific region of the world and have dire consequences for any future plans. However, China is not the only country that's unhappy with what's become known as the AUKUS Alliance. AUKUS gets its name from the abbreviations for Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Surprisingly, a member of NATO and an ally of all three nations was taken advantage of when the deal occurred. Could AUKUS tear apart long-lasting ties between Western powers, leaving China in a unique position to extend its influence? Let's find out. In March of 2021, Australian Navy Chief Vice Admiral Michael Noonan met in London with Admiral Tony Radican of Britain. The meeting was kept relatively quiet as Noonan would be asking the British military for a powerful and highly controversial vessel. It was during this meeting that talks began about arming the Australian Navy with nuclear-powered submarines. It's important to note that Australia was not looking for submarines armed with nuclear weapons, but for submarines powered by nuclear reactors to replace the diesel vessels they currently use. We'll come back to why this distinction needs to be made and why this is a huge deal to China. However, for now, it's important to know that when Vice Admiral Noonan and Admiral Radican met, this is what they discussed. It was later discovered that Australia and the United Kingdom both met with the US military leaders the month before to talk about the possibility of a military pact that would improve Australia's naval capabilities. Then at the G7 summit in June of 2021 in Cornwall, England, President Biden and then Prime Ministers Boris Johnson of Britain and Prime Minister Scott Morrison of Australia met to discuss the alliance further. Eventually, the meetings turned into an actual deal. It was agreed that both the US and UK would aid Australia in modernizing its submarine fleet. This would be a long process, but in the meantime, the US agreed to loan out some of their own nuclear-powered subs for training and military exercises to help prepare Australian sailors for their future vessels. The AUKUS agreement would evolve a few more times, culminating in the most recent update given by the leaders of all three nations in March of 2023. 
The initial AUKUS meetings were done in secret without the knowledge of the rest of the world, even though Australia had already had a previous deal with another country to build submarines. There is much more to this story, and the betrayal inflicted by these three nations will become clear later on. But first, let's look at why Australia having nuclear-powered subs has China on edge. Reason 1. Western military power in the Indo-Pacific will increase. In his most recent speech with the leaders of the UK and Australia by his side, President Biden stated, the United States has safeguarded stability in the Indo-Pacific for decades, to the enormous benefits of nations throughout the region, from ASEAN to Pacific Islanders to the People's Republic of China. This is one of China's main concerns. They already dislike the alliances the US has built in Asia, especially with South Korea and Japan, and they most certainly don't want to see that influence grow. Therefore, Australia becoming closer to the US and modernizing its navy, strengthening Western military capabilities in the region, is a serious cause for concern. China has been complaining for decades that Western expansion in their part of the world has been unacceptable and a threat to their national security. If Australia acquires nuclear-powered submarines, it could carry out more comprehensive intelligence gathering and reconnaissance missions. Their subs would be stealthier and could enter Chinese-controlled waters undetected. And in a worst-case scenario for China, these new subs could make their own naval ships obsolete. Currently, China has the largest navy in the world. However, having more ships than everyone else does not necessarily mean their navy is stronger. This is especially true if China's vessels are technologically inferior to their adversary. It's estimated that China has around 730 vessels in its navy. Nevertheless, many of these ships are old and run on obsolete technology. The nuclear-powered submarines that the US and UK are planning to equip Australia with will be able to outmaneuver, outgun, and outperform almost every naval vessel in the Chinese fleet. This is obviously one of the biggest concerns for China. It's not so much that the Australian Navy is growing, it's the fact that the Chinese forces won't be able to compete with the new subs developed by AUKUS unless they pour vast amounts of resources and time into modernizing their own naval vessels. And although the nuclear-powered subs that Australia will receive don't have nuclear weapons, they will be equipped with torpedoes and cruise missiles which could devastate Chinese forces in an armed conflict. Reason 2. Western powers will have more control over waterways in the region. During the same speech, President Biden also said, Our leadership in the Pacific has been to the benefit of the entire world. We've kept sea lanes and skies open and navigable for all. We've upheld basic rules of the road. He's referring to how the navies of the US and its allies ensure that ships from all parts of the world can pass through the Indian and Pacific Oceans without being threatened. This statement is loaded, especially when it comes to China's point of view. Although AUKUS claims that the nuclear-powered submarines will guarantee the shipping lanes remain safe for all vessels, China has a hard time believing that Western powers have everyone's best interest at heart. Instead, China sees US Navy ships in the Indo-Pacific region as encroachment by the West, and they aren't wrong. The new nuclear-powered subs would most certainly allow Australia to police the waters in their part of the world more efficiently and may even provide trade vessels with more protection from pirates and bad actors. However, it would also mean that the Chinese merchant and fishing vessels could be watched a little more closely, not to mention that Australia would be able to monitor Chinese naval movements more efficiently, which would then be shared with their allies like the United States. China does pretty much whatever it wants in the Pacific and Indian Oceans because they are the most powerful country in the region. China claims that it too makes sure shipping lanes are secured for all vessels, but it obviously has its own ship's best interests in mind. This includes hauling illegal goods across the planet or fishing where they aren't supposed to. Nuclear-powered submarines will allow Australia to have a more dominant presence in the region's waters and could threaten the way China currently does its business. There's also the fact that whoever controls the waterways can more easily enforce sanctions and trade agreements. If in the future Western powers need to place economic sanctions on China or restrict the movement of goods to and from the country for whatever reason, Australia's nuclear-powered submarines will make this process much easier. The AUKUS agreement is poised to increase Western control of the Indo-Pacific waterways, which China will not allow to happen as it has continuously stated. This has been made abundantly clear through the expansion of Chinese bases in Myanmar and further west in Djibouti. The main reason they are doing this is to protect their own shipping lanes from any type of US blockade. And if Australia gets nuclear-powered submarines, China may need to build more bases to offset an increased Western presence near their most important trade routes. It cannot be understated how important controlling the waterways in the region is for both sides. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development estimates that around 80% of global trade is transported by sea. 
And an even more astounding statistic is that 60% of total maritime trade passes through the Indo-Pacific region and into the South China Sea. Literally trillions of dollars in trade pass between the Indian and Pacific Oceans as Chinese goods travel west to South Asia, Africa, and Europe. And at that same time, resources such as natural gas and oil are carried east to fuel China's economy and military. Whoever controls these waterways controls this part of the world. Reason 3 the nuclear-powered submarines will threaten China's very way of life. China constantly warns that the encroachment of the West toward Chinese borders will not be accepted. To be fair, Western powers, particularly the United States, have formed partnerships in the Pacific and Asia to keep China in check and increase its influence in the region. The morality and ethics of indoctrinating other parts of the world into Western ideologies can be debated, and there are definitely negative consequences to the US establishing military bases around the world. But for China, this is a matter of life and death. The Chinese government is an authoritarian regime that controls everything within the country. Like other powerful nations around the world, they want to spread their influence and continue to grow the country's wealth and prosperity. However, this tends to be done through brutal crackdowns against anyone who speaks out against them and threatening retaliation if other governments oppose them. The Chinese government does not care who gets hurt as long as they can continue to grow their economy, spread their influence, and do it all their way. The spread of Western ideology and democracy threatens China's authoritarian framework with which it rules its people and interacts with the rest of the world. The same can be said about Russia and any other authoritarian rulers. Whether democracy, socialism, communism, or another form of government is the best for people can be debated. What can't be debated is that Western democracies and authoritarian rulers will never mix. Australia procuring nuclear-powered submarines and growing its ties to the United States is just another step toward the West boxing China in and preventing it from spreading its influence worldwide. Beijing has also claimed that the AUKUS alliance has created a Cold War mentality and zero-sum games, where China will have to strengthen its own position and respond with aggressive tactics to maintain the status quo. After the speech by the three leaders of AUKUS, the Chinese foreign ministry released a statement. The three countries have completely ignored the concerns of the international community and gone further down a wrong and dangerous road. This is one of their go-to arguments when it comes to Western influence spreading in Asia and the Indo-Pacific. China claims it's a matter of international security and that the West should not force its ideologies on other nations. However, when it comes to gray zone tactics and using its economic strength to influence other countries into doing what they want, China is usually pretty adamant that what they're doing is fine. So there's definitely a double standard there. The Chinese President Xi Jinping even said that the new AUKUS deal was leading to the all-round containment, encirclement, and suppression against China. The question then becomes, are the nuclear-powered submarines going to be used by Australia to contain China and suppress its expansion even further? We'd be lying if we didn't admit this would be at least part of the responsibility of the Australian nuclear-powered subfleet. It's unlikely these vessels would be used to attack Chinese ships or assets unprovoked, but they definitely will play some sort of part in keeping China in check. So, we know why China feels threatened by the nuclear-powered subs that the US, the UK, and Australia will be working on, and if all goes according to plan, the AUKUS alliance will strengthen the position of Western powers in the region. Would this be enough to cause China to attack Australia and plunge the planet into World War III? Only time will tell, but that seems unlikely. However, what is not unlikely is the continuing displeasure of one European country that was stabbed in the back by the AUKUS deal. France might hate AUKUS just as much as China. Could this mean that France might become closer to China? Let's find out. In order to understand why France is so upset about the nuclear-powered sub-deal between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the US, we need to go back to 2009. The Royal Australian Navy desperately needed to update its submarine fleet, which consisted of six Collins-class vessels. These subs were built in the 80s and are diesel-powered. A Collins-class sub can reach speeds of 10 knots, or about 12 miles per hour on the surface or at periscope depth, and 20 knots, or 23 miles per hour when submerged. They have a range of around 13,200 miles on the surface, but only 550 miles when submerged and can operate for about 70 days at a time. These older Australian subs have a test depth of around 590 feet or 180 meters, but their actual operating depth is probably much deeper, although this information is classified. Collins-class subs have six torpedo tubes with a mix of 22 Mark 48 Mod 7 torpedoes and UGM 84C Harpoon anti-ship missiles. These subs were formidable 40 years ago, but naval tech has come a long way since then, and Australia knew it needed to upgrade its fleet if it had any hope of controlling the waterways around the nation. 
and this is why the military decided it was time to build new submarines. And although nuclear-powered subs are the way of the future, Australia ruled them out for a few reasons, the biggest of which was that Australia does not use nuclear power or have any nuclear weapons, and therefore, due to the International Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it technically should not be able to obtain nuclear reactors. However, as we know, this didn't stop the AUKUS. For several years, Australian military officials and diplomats discussed possible deals with foreign countries to build a new class of submarine. They wanted something that could not only protect their waters, but ensure that Australia could control shipping lanes and conduct intel gathering missions in the region. In 2016, the Australian and French governments came to an agreement, and Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull signed a 31 billion euro deal with the Naval Group, a company that's mostly owned by the French government. The Naval Group worked with the Australian military to design a new type of sub, which they named Attack Class. This agreement became known as the Future Submarine Program. The idea was that the Attack Class submarines would be designed using the French nuclear-powered Barracuda Class subs as a template, but would be fitted with traditional propulsion systems instead of a nuclear reactor to maintain compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The attack class subs were also supposed to incorporate US Navy combat systems and torpedoes designed by Lockheed Martin Australia. The Australian government also required that at least part of every military vessel be built in Australia to create jobs. This increased the cost of constructing the attack class subs. However, even though the vessel would contain certain parts from multiple countries and be built partially in Australia, France benefited greatly from the contract. By 2019, the first round of designs was pretty much finished, and Australia agreed to a strategic partnership with Naval Group to build 12 submarines. But like with almost every military contract, there were massive delays and unforeseen costs. The money needed to build the attack class subs kept growing and growing. Before Australia and France were even ready to start assembling the vessels, the cost of the project rose to 56 billion euros, almost double what the initial contract was for. Negotiations continued for months, and in February of 2021, the initial plans were deemed too expensive and were scrapped. The Australian government gave Naval Group seven months to revise their plans and present new ones that would reduce the cost of the project. Obviously, at this point, tensions were high between all parties involved, so much so that Australia put contingency plans in place in case the project with France failed. And when Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison met French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris during the summer of 2021, both voiced their concerns over the submarine debacle. Although Macron did reassure Morrison that France would do everything it could to guarantee the success of the submarine contract. To reaffirm their commitment, France and Australia released a joint statement saying that the foreign and defense ministers knew the importance of the future submarine program and would continue to push forward. However, it appeared not everyone was on the same page because less than three weeks later Australia would abruptly call off the deal. On September 16, 2021, the Australian government released a public statement cancelling the deal with France, and the attack class submarine was dead in the water. They had already spent around 1.5 billion euros on the project, and it was likely that Australia would need to pay hundreds of millions more in penalties for prematurely cancelling the contract. However, the benefits appeared to outweigh the costs. The French were outraged by the sudden and public collapse of their deal with Australia. But what happened next would enrage and embarrass France, driving them to publicly denounce the new alliance that had formed. What Prime Minister Morrison claimed Australia needed sent shockwaves across the world. He stated that his country could no longer be effective at maintaining open trade routes and protecting the region without nuclear submarines. The speed, carrying capacity, and stealthiness of these vessels were vital to safeguarding the interests of Australia and the rest of the free world. Soon after the cancellation of the contract with France, AUKUS was announced. It was at this point that China started to voice its displeasure. Australia building new diesel-powered subs with France wasn't a big deal. However, if they procured nuclear-powered submarines from the United States, it would be a huge cause for concern. Let's now fast forward to the G7 summit that we mentioned earlier. Biden, Johnson, and Morrison met behind closed doors and in secret. They made it a point to not inform France of the dealings that were going on behind the scenes. This was possible due to the recent departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union post-Brexit. If Britain hadn't left the EU, these talks would not have been possible, at least not with the UK involved as it would breach at least some of the trade and foreign relation laws established to maintain the cooperative nature of the European Union. When the U.S. was brought into the conversation, Biden made it clear that there was no guarantee the U.S. would enter an agreement. Also, the Biden administration needed assurance that Australia ending the deal with France was not a ploy to have the U.S. step in and take over. Morrison reassured the U.S. president that this was not the case, as the Australian government had been considering alternatives to the attack-class submarine deal for over 18 months. 
AUKUS started under the guise of a joint capabilities and interoperability agreement, although when the new alliance was explained further, it was shown to include improving cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, and additional undersea capabilities. The undersea capabilities are likely the part that caught France's attention. However, everything else on the list was bad news for China, which is why when AUKUS was announced, it wasn't just France that was voicing its discontent. China was right there with them. Let's take a closer look at the other components of AUKUS before coming back to the nuclear-powered submarines that resulted from the deal and why China, along with many other nations, including NATO members, are concerned. The AUKUS Pact includes provisions for all three countries to work together and develop hypersonic missiles and defense against them. If we're to believe reports coming out of China, they are light years ahead of the US and the rest of NATO in hypersonic technology. And since it's believed hypersonic missiles will be one of the most important weapons in the future of warfare, this is bad news for the West. These missiles travel five times faster than the speed of sound, are incredibly hard to intercept, and can cause massive amounts of damage. It's unlikely that China has a large number of operational hypersonic missiles, but the US and its allies need to expand research efforts if they're going to keep from falling behind. China is not a fan of any agreements to increase the military capabilities of Western power, so they're adamant that many parts of the AUKUS deal are warmongering actions against their well-being. This also goes for the increased information sharing that the AUKUS deal will generate between the three nations. However, it's the nuclear-powered submarines that China is the most upset about. Anything that will threaten their dominance of the Indo-Pacific waterways in the region is a cause for their concern. Again, it can't be understated how important these maritime routes are for global trade and the movement of military assets for China. They need to be able to counter any Western blockades that could be implemented in the future, and the only way to do that is through controlling key waterways in the region. Any vessels, especially nuclear-powered submarines, that may threaten China's ability to move freely in the Pacific and Indian Oceans will not be tolerated. Now, before we move into the discussion around exactly what the nuclear-powered subs will look like and the specific military repercussions they can have on China, let's jump back to France real quick and see if the AUKUS deal is enough to drive them into the arms of the West's most powerful enemy. During the AUKUS deal, it was reported that the only other country mentioned in the discussion was France. However, there was no apology offered. France lost billions of euros when the future submarine program abruptly ended. This obviously angered the French government, but there's no chance that France will ever join China just because its pride was hurt. Franco-Chinese relations extend about as far as most European countries. France most definitely buys goods and tech from China like the rest of the world, but they're not about to become allies because of AUKUS. France is still part of NATO and the EU. Losing a submarine contract definitely won't change that. So, even though there was betrayal by some of the closest allies, France will maintain close ties with the US, Australia, and Britain. So what is it exactly about the nuclear-powered subs that Australia will be getting that has China so upset? After all, there will be no nuclear weapons aboard these subs. Do they really pose that much of a threat? Under the agreement, the United States will be sharing its nuclear propulsion tech with Australia. The United Kingdom has had a similar agreement with the U.S. since 1958, when the U.S.-U.K. Mutual Defense Agreement was formed. So, their submarines already operate using this technology. The new submarines being designed to replace the Collins-class vessels will likely be similar to the Virginia-class submarines that the U.S. is currently transitioning to. This means we can expect the new Australian subs to have a few key features and specifications. The reactors aboard the new submarines will likely be an S9G nuclear reactor, generating 280,000 horsepower or about 210 megawatts of energy. This reactor will be connected to steam turbines and a single shaft pump jet propulsor that will allow the sub to travel around 30 miles per hour. This is faster than the current Australian subs, but the nuclear reactor has another huge advantage over diesel-powered submarines. The nuclear reactors aboard US subs can produce enough energy to power the vessel non-stop for decades. Basically, the nuclear reactor will allow Australian submarines to travel underwater for any amount of distance and time. The only thing that limits its capabilities is the need to stop to resupply the crew and routine maintenance. Knowing this, it's not hard to see why this new class of Australian submarines poses such a threat to China. Refueling isn't a concern for these new subs when conducting missions or patrolling waterways, which puts any conventional Chinese vessels at a disadvantage. These new subs will also likely have a test depth of at least 800 feet, but will be able to go much deeper if needed. We don't know exactly what type of armaments the new nuclear-powered submarines will have, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that the vessels will contain a complement similar to the Virginia-class subs, minus the nuclear 
ballistic missiles. This means the Australian subs could have VLS anti-ship missiles or even Tomahawk long-range missiles for strikes against land targets. There will also probably be at least four torpedo tubes, and the vessel will be able to carry many more missiles and torpedoes than the Collins-class subs. When all is said and done, the nuclear-powered submarines that AUKUS is developing will pose a huge military threat to China. There's no doubt that having these vessels patrolling Indo-Pacific waters is something that Beijing wants to avoid at all costs, but there is still time before these submarines will be built and launched, which is good news for China. What isn't such good news is that during the transition period between phasing out the Collins-class subs and the new nuclear-powered vessels, the United States and the UK will deploy their own nuclear-powered submarines to the region to allow Australian soldiers to learn how to work work the systems and engineers to work with the nuclear reactors. The United States likely jumped at the opportunity to deploy nuclear-powered subs to the region. The AUKUS agreement gives them a non-aggressive reason to deploy more vessels in the Indo-Pacific, since it's all being done for training Australia. In reality, having more US and UK submarines in the region will only strengthen the West's position, which is a huge problem for China. All three nations deny that suppressing China through an increased naval presence had anything to do with the AUKUS deal, but it's hard to deny that more US and UK subs in the Indian and Pacific waters isn't an enticing part of the plan. As it stands right now, only six countries have nuclear-powered submarines. There are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, the United States, and India. So Australia would only be the seventh nation in the entire world to have nuclear-powered underwater vessels. There are a few reasons why so few countries have nuclear-powered ships, but one of them is access to the necessary materials. In order for a country to produce nuclear reactors that can power submarines and ships, it needs to have facilities to generate nuclear fuel. Unfortunately, any nation that has the ability to do this also has the foundation for creating nuclear weapons. This is when the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty comes into play. For the safety of the planet, it's better if we don't increase the number of nuclear weapons already in existence. Therefore, limitations are put on who can generate nuclear materials, how much can be made, and what it can be used for. But not everyone follows the rules, and much to the chagrin of China and many other countries around the world, AUKUS has found a way around the rules. Before we get into how the AUKUS countries exploited a loophole to allow Australia to acquire nuclear-powered submarines, let's see where the agreement stands. The United States said that sharing its nuclear propulsion technology is a one-off event, and it's been reported that South Korea, which is closely allied with the US, also has ambitions to obtain nuclear-powered submarines, but the US refused this request in 2020, citing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So it is a bit strange that the US is willing to breach that very treaty to supply Australia with nuclear subs. China has called out the US on their breach of the treaty and has rightfully stated, like many other nations, that the actions of the AUKUS could jeopardize the planet's safety. On August 31, 2022, the UK agreed to send the HMS Anson S-123, an astute class nuclear-powered submarine, to Australia in order for their submariners to begin training. On March 8, 2023, the United States announced that Australia would buy three Virginia-class nuclear submarines with the option of purchasing two more in the future. The US stated that the acquisition of these subs would fulfill an important transitional period as Collins-class subs are phased out. However, there's still a long-term plan to design a new Australian submarine that would be built in conjunction with the US and Britain. Now China is facing a huge dilemma. The US seems to be willing to break international norms to help Australia become more dominant in the region. The fact that both the US and the UK will be sending nuclear-powered subs to the region in the near future is bad news for China even if they're only for training purposes. That, along with the fact that Australia will procure three Virginia-class subs in the coming decade, means that China's timeline for a response has become greatly reduced. It's highly likely that China is looking for ways to offset the nuclear-powered vessels that Australia is acquiring, and this could be very bad news for everyone. The argument becomes, if the United States and Britain can break the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, why can't China? What is stopping them from exploiting the same loophole in arming Myanmar, Pakistan, North Korea, or any other authoritarian regime? Regime with nuclear-powered submarines. Let's look a little bit closer at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and see how exactly the US and the UK got around it and how China could do the same thing in the future. The main purpose of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is to control the amount of nuclear fuel produced, whether for weapons or nuclear reactors in general. However, a provision allows the non-nuclear weapon states, such as Australia, to produce highly enriched uranium for use in naval ship reactors. This is part of the agreement that the United States and the United Kingdom used to justify delivering nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. The problem is that this part of the treaty is generally agreed to be for surface ships, not submarines. The reason for this is that the International Atomic Energy Agency, also known as IAEA, which is the organization that monitors nuclear fuel production and compliance, can't easily inspect and safeguard
guard reactors on submarines for obvious reasons. There's no such thing as a surprise inspection on a submarine whose location is classified deep under the waters of the ocean. No one believes that Australia will siphon off nuclear fuel from their submarine reactors to build nuclear weapons, but the same can't be said for every country. A perfect example of this happened in 2018. Iran informed IAEA that it was planning to build its own naval nuclear propulsion system in the future. This gave them the pretext to remove some of their nuclear materials from the safeguards put in place by the IAEA. They then could use this material to create their own naval nuclear reactor for ships or use the fuel for more nefarious purposes. Iran has yet to remove any of their nuclear material from safeguards, which was likely due to pressure from both Russia and China, who don't want to elicit a response from Western nations. What the AUKUS agreement does is set the precedent for removing nuclear materials from safeguards in the future. If a nation wanted access to nuclear-powered submarines or just nuclear materials in general, it could cite the AUKUS agreement to the International Atomic Energy Agency for doing so. Technically, since submarines are naval vessels, what the US, UK, and Australia are doing is not breaching the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, it does set a dangerous precedent, which China has been very vocal about. They're not the only ones. Many leaders around the world are nervous about what this agreement could mean in the future and the damage it could do to the non-proliferation of nuclear materials. To be fair, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty doesn't do much to prevent the use of nuclear material to create weapons. For one thing, a perpetrator would need to be caught first. Also, so there are no actual consequences for non-compliance. Any nation that's in violation of the treaty is referred to the UN Security Council, which then decides what to do. But since the members of this council are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, there is very little agreement about what should be done if someone breaks the treaty. This means it falls to the international community to condemn countries that take advantage of the IAEA and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, when the parties in question are the United States and the United Kingdom, it's difficult for other nations to stand up to their decisions. The US is the only superpower in the world, and with that title has massive influence over many countries. It's unlikely that anyone in NATO, except perhaps France, will fully condemn the AUKUS deal. However, if China were to do the same thing, there might be some repercussions. These would probably come in the form of sanctions, but as things stand now, it's not clear how far the West would be willing to go to punish China for doing something that the US and UK have already done. Like China is currently doing, the United States and its allies would likely voice their displeasure with nuclear materials being shared. But it's hard to argue against something like delivering nuclear reactors to a country without nuclear capabilities when you've done the same exact thing. It's this double standard that has the whole world on edge. China is currently in a unique position to have its complaints heard since they have the second largest economy and military after the US. However, the stronger US allies get through things like the AUKUS deal, the more difficult it'll be for China to spread its power and influence in the future. China's most powerful ally is Russia, and we know how they are not nearly as strong as Putin claims. Therefore, China might be looking to build alliances with other nations that could offer strategic bases in the Indo-Pacific region. This is why China has been building alliances with many nations in Asia and Africa. But arming countries that could support China in the future is a dangerous proposition. It can also take time, which due to the AUKUS agreement China might be running out of. In the years to come, AUKUS may be the catalyst for increased tension in Indo-Pacific waters as China tries to strengthen its position. It's not clear what steps they'll take, but new talks between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin may indicate that there will be a renewed push to combat the encroachment of Western ideologies and influence into the realms that China intends to control. The nuclear submarines that will be delivered to Australia will likely only further increase tensions between China and the West. However, how far China is willing to go is not yet clear. They are undoubtedly scared that these new subs will allow the West to blockade their ports and control shipping lanes more easily. Could World War III be started over a nuclear-powered submarine agreement? Unfortunately for us all, it's not out of the realm of possibility. The exploitation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty by the US and UK is a dangerous thing. China's main concerns are for its well-being, just like every other nation around the world. Of course, they are more powerful than most, and they have an enormous amount of influence in certain parts of the world because of their economic might. However, this could all be put in jeopardy if Australia uses its nuclear-powered submarines to police the Indian Pacific Seas. If this is a move to monitor and regulate China's trade routes, it could lead to a very real conflict in the future. Both the West and China claim their only goal for increasing their military strength in the region is to protect trading vessels and promote free movement in its waters. Yet it's quite evident that much more is at stake as nuclear-powered subs are deployed in the region. China's one-child policy was implemented to slow the nation's rapidly growing population, but a law that was supposed to save the country may have doomed it instead. Now China's future is looking grim. 
The one-child policy led to a rapidly aging population without younger generations to support it, a birth rate that is not sustainable, and infanticide of female babies. The saddest part is if China had done nothing, its population growth would have slowed as it developed. Countless lives could have been saved, and a severe economic collapse would not be on the horizon. Let's take a brief look at what the one-child policy was, why it was created, why it had to end, and how it might have doomed China's future. In 1949, the People's Republic of China was formed from the Republic of China, which was preceded by thousands of years of dynastic rule. It was in the infancy of the PCR that the government started promoting birth control and family planning. It was clear that if the nation was going to modernize and move forward toward industrialization, it would need to get its population growth under control. Resources were required to fuel the economy and build infrastructure, which meant there would be less to go around. When Mao Zedong died in 1976, he was succeeded by Deng Xiaoping. When Xiaoping took over, he found the country's population rapidly approaching 1 billion people. It was decided that a new and much stricter strategy for slowing population growth was needed. In 1978, the government announced a voluntary program that would be put in place encouraging Chinese families to have two or fewer children. It was framed as reducing the population growth being good for China, and every citizen should do their part. But the following year, the decision was made to lower the number of children a family could have to only one. This one-child policy applied to mostly urban areas and certain provinces in China. It was these areas that the population was growing the fastest, and it was much easier for the government to keep an eye on the citizens living in cities than it was to enforce this new one-child policy on the more rural areas of the country. On September 25, 1980, the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party published an official bulletin to all party members that the new population control measures should be implemented throughout the nation. This would become the official start date of the one-child policy in China. It's important to note that during the time between the discussion of slowing population growth and the official enactment of the one-child policy, things had changed a lot. Medicine and technology were much more advanced, which meant fewer child-age deaths and that older people were living longer. The catalyst for the perfect storm of demographic problems had its foundation long before the government began restricting the number of children people could have. For centuries, it made sense to have large families so that there were many hands to help work in the fields and carry out manual labor. But this was not the future of China, or at least not the future the government wanted in China. Industrialization made having large families not only less desirable, but obsolete now that machines could do much of the work. If the Chinese government had paused for a moment to think about the ramifications of intervening in the natural family practices that occur during the modernization of a country, they would have realized they were about to make a huge mistake. But this is something we'll come back to later on. The one-child policy is pretty self-explanatory. Basically, the vast majority of Chinese families can now only have one child per couple. If they had more, there would be consequences. However, there were several exceptions to the rule. Some minority groups, farmers, fishermen, and people with disabilities were allowed to have more than one child to help with the labor-intensive aspects of their lives. Like so many laws in an authoritarian regime, people in power could also be exempt from the policy due to their status. However, the one-child policy applied to pretty much everyone else and was seen as the solution to China's biggest problem. Now things are going to get uncomfortable. If a couple had a second child and did not fall into one of the various exemption categories, they were heavily fined or had to suffer much more severe punishments. The couples could be harassed by the community, lose their jobs, or may have even had their extra child or children taken from them. But things would soon turn even grimmer for violators of the law. After the one-child policy began, there were some initial consequences that arose. To be fair, it did cause birth rates to decline and population growth to slow. But this did not happen in a sustainable or organic way. With each year that passed, the sex ratio between males and females became more skewed. Remember from biology class that a population left to its own devices will have a sex ratio at birth of approximately 50% boys and 50% girls because that's how genetics works. Well, China was messing with the natural order of things by pressuring couples to only have one child. And since there was one sex that was more desirable than the other for certain reasons we'll discuss in a bit, you can probably guess what happened next. Now to be fair, humans are peculiar in the sense that our sex ratio at birth tends to be 51% boys to 49% girls. Scientists believe this happens more because female fetuses die during pregnancy due to a variety of factors. This results in slightly more males being born than females in a given human population. Regardless, what is important is the ratio should be relatively close to 
Instead, during the one-child policy, the Chinese population saw around a 3-4% to increase in male births compared to female births. This would have drastic consequences down the road, but what it meant initially was both shocking and appalling. Chinese families preferred to have a male baby because sons inherited the family name, which continues the lineage. Males are also traditionally responsible for the care of their elderly parents. This meant that many families given a choice would rather have a male child than a female child, which probably gives you an idea of what was to come. By examining the ratio of males to females who are alive today and born during the one-child policy era in China, we know there are around 120 males to every 100 females. Looking at the larger picture, this means that there are approximately 30 million more males than females in the country. However, this is a nice way of putting it. To put it bluntly, the ratio of males to females has been skewed due to the government's population control policy, which means that researchers estimated around 30 million female babies were either aborted, killed, or taken out of the country as a result of the one-child policy. There were also instances where families had multiple children, but since any babies born after the first child needed to be hidden from the government and unreported, it led to millions of undocumented individuals who would face many hardships later in life. They would not be able to go to school or find employment. Their options for any type of future became very limited. It's estimated that this happened to hundreds of thousands or even millions of people in China. And the ironic part is that now China desperately needs every one of its citizens to work and have offspring, even if they were undocumented in the past. An interesting and less tragic result of the one-child policy was that tens of thousands of Chinese girls were adopted by families around the world during this time. As word of the atrocities occurring in China reached other countries, nonprofits and adoption organizations sprung into action to try to save the lives of as many young girls as possible. This was good news for any female who was adopted by a kind family and able to get out of the country, but not everyone had a happy ending. The removal of young girls from China also led to an even wider gap between the number of males and females in China, since those who were adopted likely did not and will not return to China to get married and live out the rest of their lives for obvious reasons. And this also brings up another ramification of what happened as a result of the one-child policy. Now around one quarter of the male population in China will never get married because there just aren't enough women. We're not saying everyone needs to get married or that everyone wants to get married, but we are saying that approximately 17% of the male population doesn't even have the option. It's not clear what the social ramifications of this disparity will be, if any, but some experts suggest it could lead to social unrest in the future. So the one-child policy caused a huge amount of problems from the get-go and would result in several much bigger problems in the future. However, it did succeed in reducing birth rates and slowing population growth, which was the goal. But eventually, the Chinese government decided to do away with the policy altogether. This was more out of necessity than because they were willing to admit the glaringly obvious flaws in their plans. In 1970, the population growth rate of China was 2.5%. By the year 2000, it had decreased to 0.7%. Unfortunately for China, the one-child policy continued for 16 more years after that, which resulted in long-lasting problems that might lead to economic collapse. Most experts agree that if the one-child policy had ended much sooner, its future consequences could be managed, but that's not what happened. Instead, China continued its aggressive stance on population control for far too long, and birth rates plummeted well below sustainable levels. In 2013, China decided that all couples could now have two children if either parent was from a single-child household. The reason for doing this was that birth rates had declined by too much, and the government needed to slowly ramp up population growth if they were going to have a large enough workforce to continuously fuel their economy. It seemed to work as birth rates went up the following year, but not by nearly as much as expected. In 2015, only 1.45 million couples out of the 11 million eligible decided to have a second baby. It became glaringly obvious that China had overshot the acceptable level of population control. They were now in big trouble as the nation's population was growing older and there were not enough babies being born to support the aging generations in the years to come. China had reached the point of no return, and a monstrous demographic problem reared its ugly head. This demographic problem is the direct result of decades of one-child policy and is the biggest threat to the stability of the country that they've ever faced. It's important to know that, left to its own devices, the population of China would have eventually declined anyway. Yes, their population growth was likely unsustainable due to limited available resources in the country and conflicting views on how to use those resources, but we've seen that as nations industrialize and become more developed, 
birth rates go down for a variety of reasons. Most of these reasons have to do with education, work-life balance, and the cost of living. In fact, pretty much every developed country on the planet is experiencing or will experience a population decline in the near future due to this very phenomenon. So, if China had just left things alone, its population growth problem would have eventually fixed itself in a more manageable way. Economists and demographic researchers both in China and globally warned the government of the consequences of their one-child policy, yet, like with so many important decisions, the government did not listen to the experts. In 2021, the Chinese leadership announced married couples can now have as many kids as they wanted. The government also promised to fund more programs such as child care, job security initiatives for expecting parents, and financial assistance to couples who wish to grow their families. This was the official end to any type of government mandate regarding the number of children a family could have. The Chinese government knew this needed to be done, as academics and researchers continuously sounded the alarm for years that the future was looking very grim if China's birth rates didn't begin to increase. As of the last few years, China's population has still been growing, but this is due to a combination of births and people living longer, so these numbers are a bit deceiving. Most experts predicted that the Chinese population would peak sometime between 2020 and 2030 and then go into decline. The Chinese Health Department said in 2021 that it expected the population decline to occur within the next three years. Best estimates from sources worldwide put China's population declining as soon as this year or at least by 2025. China's current birth rate is around 1.7 children per couple, which is significantly lower than the 2.5 children per couple needed to maintain a stable population. This is bad news, because as we're about to explain, China no longer needs to slow its population growth. They need to ramp it up. What it comes down to is that China needed to end its one-child policy long ago. Currently, there just aren't enough young people to sustain the economic growth of the country and support the growing retired and elderly population. China defines its working age population as anyone between 16 and 59. This demographic has continuously been declining in number since 2012. The United Nations predicts that China could have 61 million fewer workers by 2030, which will not be sustainable if China hopes to continue to grow its economy and spread its influence around the world. China currently has a 5 to 1 worker to retiree ratio. This is somewhat sustainable, but if the birth rate continues to decline or if China manages to somehow keep it relatively constant, it'll still mean that by around 2040, the worker to retiree ratio will be closer to 1.6 to 1. This is absolutely not sustainable, as there just won't be enough workers paying taxes to sustain social programs for the retired population. On top of that, the economy will go into decline, as the demographics who are working and spending money to fuel the economy will be significantly lower than it is right now. The elderly population of China is also becoming greatly concerned with the ability of their children and grandchildren to support them like in the past. When parents had several children to look after them, it spread out the responsibility and financial burden. This made taking care of the parents and grandparents easier on everyone. However, for decades, families have only been having one child, which does not create the same kind of familial support network as in the past. It's expected that the public spending on healthcare will need to be doubled before 2050, as the aging population will require more doctors, hospitals, and medicine. This means that the government will have no choice but to divert resources from other sectors if they want to take care of their elderly citizens. Basically, the culmination of all the problems that the one-child policy caused has left China with a disaster that could cripple the nation. This is why the policy needed to be ended long ago. So now that couples are allowed to have as many children as they want, China's problems are over and the nation's on its way to recovery, right? Wrong. The demographic problem is like a snowball rolling downhill. It's already been set in motion. And as it keeps rolling, it's getting bigger and bigger. At some point, it'll crash and cause a big mess. Then, and only then, can China start rebuilding their metaphorical snow castle. The change in policy in 2013 to allow Chinese couples to have two children did not help raise birth rates. The removal of all restrictions on how many children a couple can have will likely not change anything either. When looking at if ending the one-child policy and any subsequent policies will fix the demographic problem China is facing, the answer is no. In 2021, there were approximately 10 million babies born in China. This is the lowest number of births since 1949. The dialing back of restrictions has not had any measurable impact on birth rates and likely won't in the future. This is because the attitudes and desires of the Chinese people have changed as the nation has grown. 
People are waiting longer to start a family as they're more career focused. More and more Chinese women are pursuing degrees in higher education and securing jobs of their own. This is very common in developing and developed nations. When women have more opportunities and education, they tend to have fewer children, both by choice and for economic reasons. But it's not just having kids that the Chinese people are waiting longer to do. The average age that people are getting married is increasing as well. In 2010, on average, women were 24 and men were 26 when they got married. In 2020, the ages for both sexes were around 29 years old. So it's clear that people are putting off family life longer, which is definitely not going to help China's population problem. The crazy part is that the Chinese government has only itself to blame. And even if someone did want to have multiple kids, there is so much time, planning, and money that needs to be spent to raise a child that it acts as a deterrent. So the high cost of children plus women planning to have only one or maybe two babies at a later age is a recipe for disaster when it comes to stabilizing the population of China. The one-child policy was brutal and worked too well. Now China is paying for it with an increasingly older population and not enough young people willing to increase birth rates. On top of this, there just won't be enough people to support the growing Chinese economy in the future due to the skewed demographics, which are also the result of the former one-child policy. So what, if anything, can China do to save the country from economic collapse? If China's looking for immediate results, they're out of luck. Providing financial and social support for families to have more than one child is a good idea but a slow one. Even if birth rates skyrocketed right now, those babies won't be able to contribute to the economy and social welfare system for another 18 or so years. By that point, China would be in so much trouble that all the young people entering the workforce wouldn't make much of a difference. And since it's clear Chinese couples are in no rush to have larger families, this would not be a viable option. Many experts say that improving the average productivity of workers, the efficiency of markets, and allowing immigrants into the country to contribute to the economy might be able to help save China from the economic collapse when the large population of older workers retires. It has also been suggested that China could raise the retirement age so that those older workers contribute to the economy for longer. But this would likely just be a band-aid that wouldn't really solve the problem. It'll likely come down to improving worker productivity and education along with removing some of the unnecessary red tape that the state uses to maintain control of everything going on in the country. Immigration might also be one of the only options China has if it's serious about continuing to grow its workforce. There is little chance that the Chinese people will be able to increase population growth on their own after decades of the one-child policy. There is no easy answer for China. At this point, the coming demographic crisis is inevitable. Will the nation be able to weather the storm? Probably. Will it lead to pain and suffering as the authoritarian government tries to grow its economy and power while the population growth is on the decline? Absolutely. Older generations will likely suffer as younger generations are overworked. In an extremely dystopian future, China could force their citizens to have more children just like they forced them to have fewer children in the past. But that doesn't seem like a very likely scenario. A Chinese submarine lurks below the waters of the Indian Ocean. Suddenly, an explosion rocks the vessel. An anti-submarine torpedo has struck the stern. Water begins rushing in as compartments are sealed. The Chinese crew blows the ballasts. They need to surface now or the submarine will sink to the ocean floor, crushing all who are inside. The torpedo was launched from the newly deployed Indian anti-submarine warfare shallow watercraft corvette. It's been tracking the Chinese intruder for several hours. The sub sends an emergency message for help back to China as it breaks the surface. The People's Navy deploys to the region. As it passes through the Malacca Strait, Indian destroyers, frigates, and aircraft carriers lie in wait at several choke points. The vessels unload their cannons, missiles, and torpedoes. The trapped Chinese ships are decimated. This hypothetical scenario may happen in the future, and it might be closer than you think. But thanks to one specific set of islands, India might have the advantage if China ever tries to expand its influence further into the Indian Ocean. The chain known as the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are in one of the most strategically significant locations in the world. This bit of land may hold the key to balancing the powers rising in South and East Asia. For decades, India has been slowly militarizing the island chain. But progress has been slow. That all might change in the coming years, as China tries to expand its influence further south and west. India is feeling the pressure both economically and to their national security. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands are their best chance of securing the waters along India's coastline while monitoring the shipping routes that much of the traffic in the region uses. This includes Chinese vessels, which is why these Indian islands have Beijing very worried. It probably goes without saying that India and China don't have the best relationship. 
there are constant clashes between the troops along their borders in the Himalayas, as there's never been an agreement over exactly where India ends and Chinese-controlled Tibet begins. Conflict between the two nations is only exacerbated by both governments trying to boost their economies while becoming more influential on a global scale. It's these two nations who are fighting for supremacy in East and Southeast Asia as they grow in strength. However, in terms of global economic power, the waterways between China and India are key. Both countries have formidable armies and navies, but for China, it's imperative that they have access to the Indian Ocean for several reasons. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands could really put a damper on China's plans for the future. The key here is to remember that whoever controls the Malacca Strait controls the main waterway that ships use to move goods and supplies between the Indian Ocean and East Asia. This includes goods from Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Europe. Right now, India is in a position to be the dominant player in controlling the area thanks to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Let's look at the history, importance, and strategic significance of the islands. As we dive deeper into this region of the world, it'll become glaringly clear why China is so terrified that India is increasing the militarization of the Andaman and Nicobar chain. It's very possible that what India does in the coming year could directly impact China's ability to spread its influence in the region. In a worst-case scenario, these islands might be ground zero for an all-out conflict between India and China. The island chain itself is 22 nautical miles from Myanmar and only 90 miles from Indonesia. This allows India's navy and aircraft to have quick and easy access to not only the Bay of Bengal, but the 6-degree and 10-degree channels, through which around 60,000 vessels pass each year. The importance of this region cannot be overstated, as Chinese trading ships require access to these waters, otherwise a large part of their trade network would come screeching to a halt. To put it into perspective, China receives around three-quarters of all of its oil from trade routes running through the Indian Ocean. If they were to lose access to these shipping lanes, it would be devastating for their economy and infrastructure. If we go back in time, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands have always been a strategically important location. Chinese Buddhist monks of the 7th century, Arab travelers hundreds of years ago, and even Marco Polo visited the islands. This is because they serve as a vital stopping point while traveling through the waters connecting the Indian and Pacific Oceans. When the British colonized India, they turned the Andaman Islands into a penal colony. The use by the British pushed indigenous communities out and eventually led to the establishment of Port Blair, which now contains a naval base and airfield. When India gained its independence in 1947, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands were officially incorporated into their borders. Over the years, the islands have developed into a popular tourist destination for people in the region. However, it's not the growing tourism industry that China is worried about, it's the growing military presence that concerns them. Over the last couple of decades, China has been increasingly trying to expand its influence in the Indian Ocean. They've deployed expeditionary naval forces, conducted arms sales, and made strategic connections with other nations throughout the region. This obviously worried India, which then forced the government to seek out ways to bring Chinese expansion to a stop or at least slow it down. It quickly became apparent that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands could be the answer to India's problems. Its location allows for the monitoring of the different waterways in the region along with large areas of the mainland. China's used the guise of anti-piracy operations to send submarines and naval vessels into the waters off the coast of India. They've also established bases in places like Gwadar and Djibouti to increase their military presence in the Indian Ocean, but China's been expanding its naval operations closer to India's borders as well. For example, Chinese naval and survey vessels have been sighted in the Andaman Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and even in India's exclusive economic zone. It's clear that China is becoming more aggressive in its actions in the South China Sea along with parts of South Asia. They constructed artificial islands where they deployed military personnel and assets, and this has been a huge cause of concern for nations like Taiwan. But there's also a real concern that the militarization of the South China Sea could cause irreparable harm to the freedom of navigation rules in the Indo-Pacific region. This open trade agreement is vital to maintaining peace and political stability in the area. India has been keeping a close eye on China's actions in the South China Sea and is planning for a future where China starts expanding into the Andaman Sea or the Bay of Bengal. China is already engaged in illegal and unregulated fishing practices in the areas, which is a resource vital to India and other countries in the region that border the ocean. For years, China has been pushing its luck to see how much it can get away with. India has become fed up and is starting to take more drastic actions by using the Andaman and Nicobar Islands to strengthen their position and keep China in check. The increase of military assets being deployed to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands is taking their time. More naval ships and personnel are deployed on the islands every year in preparation for a more aggressive stance in the waters of the region. 
At Point Blair, the small military base is being reimagined as an intelligence hub where aircraft, ships, and communication airways can set up to gather more intel about China's military movements. This strategic listening post will provide India with the upper hand in the region, especially if they need to take naval action, which is obviously a cause of concern for China. As the Andaman and Nicobar Islands become more of a military asset to India, China's ability to push the boundaries of where their ships and aircraft can go without repercussions diminishes. In the future, the intelligence gathered by radar and listening posts on the islands could inform not just the Indian military, but other nations who might also have interests to protect in the region, such as Australia, Japan, and even the US. But with the ability to gather more intelligence, India also needs to be able to control what's happening in the area. One key aspect of this is promoting the island chain as an economic hub and port for trade ships. This is why India has plans to build a major port at Great Nicobar Island that's estimated to cost $1.5 billion. And for China, any country that poses a threat to its economic might is a country that they will look to punish. If India is successful in creating a major transshipment port on the Andaman and Nicobar Island chain, Chinese ships will likely need to utilize it to maintain certain trade agreements. Since India is already battling an economic war to secure jobs, resources, and manufacturing contracts with China, the leadership of the People's Republic is probably less than thrilled that they might have to use Indian-controlled ports in the future. If India can entice the international community to use their ports in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, it could allow them to gain a substantial piece of the enormous amount of trade that's done with China. This will also allow India and the countries they're close to to control supply chains, which might allow sanctions on China to be more easily enforced. The repercussions of this reality could be disastrous for the Chinese economy. China is likely extremely worried about how India's ports in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will affect their ability to procure resources from Africa and Europe. But there's also another issue for China if the islands become a mainstream stop for vessels passing through the region. Southeast Asian nations such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore rely heavily on Chinese goods. However, if there's easier access to global markets, they might start trading with other parts of the world. No matter how China looks at it, if the Andaman and Nicobar Islands become economic and shipment hubs, their own trade network could be put into jeopardy. And if all of this wasn't enough, now the quadrilateral security dialogue between Australia, India, Japan, and the United States has resulted in military exercises being conducted near the islands. These exercises are identifying shortcomings in India's ability to successfully protect its waterways and allowing for future plans to defend and control all major channels running through the region to be more effective. However, a big problem is becoming increasingly clear to India as it tries to strengthen its position, and China is almost certainly aware of it. When comparing India's naval capability with China, there's a huge gap. China has the largest navy in the world, and we all know from the war in Ukraine, having more military vessels does not necessarily mean a nation will be able to win a war. However, numbers are definitely on China's side at the moment. According to estimates, China has around 730 naval vessels, while India has about 295. Both countries have two aircraft carriers, but India is vastly outnumbered in every other type of naval vessel. China has 50 destroyers, 43 frigates, 72 corvettes, and 78 submarines. India, on the other hand, has 11 destroyers, 12 frigates, 19 corvettes, and 18 submarines. You can see the massive disparity between the two forces, but, and this is a big but, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands could help negate the differences in numbers due to its strategic location. Even if a large Chinese fleet was able to traverse the Malacca Strait, India would still have several choke points around the islands that could be used to counteract the numbers of China's navy. If the Chinese navy was drawn too close to the islands, India could launch missiles, rockets, and artillery from the shoreline to cause massive damage. On top of this, if China becomes too aggressive, the joint missions being conducted as a result of the quadrilateral security dialogue means that India will likely receive some help from one or all of the nations that they conduct exercises with. In recent years, China has been using one of their favorite tactics to try to gain the upper hand in the waters around India. Misdirection and straight-up lies are employed to draw attention away from what they're really doing. When India started deploying more ships and military personnel to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, China deployed submarines to the area. This was done to gather information, but when China was caught in Indian waters, they claimed ignorance and said that the misplaced submarine had nothing to do with India's deployment of military assets to Andaman and Nicobar. The Chinese Defense Ministry also said that the People's Liberation Army often cooperates with other militaries in the region, including India, which only added positive factors for regional peace and stability. What China was really doing was responding to India's naval deployment in the Andaman Sea. 
and when they got caught, Chinese leadership made up some BS to try and distract from the fact that they were in India's territory. This has happened time and time again, such as in the waters around Taiwan, the Himalayan border with India, and anywhere else China has a military presence. These operations are called gray zone tactics, in which China uses disruptive measures and aggression that doesn't result in war, but is not appropriate during peacetime either. Naval incursions into Indian territory, the setting up of naval bases in the Indian Ocean, and conflicts along the Himalayan border are all gray zone initiatives that China's using to weaken or threaten India. To counteract China's constant encroachments and desire to expand its influence into the Indian Ocean, a new set of airstrips is being built into the northern and southern islands of Andaman and Nicobar. Indian defense officials say that these airfields will serve two purposes. The first is to extend their ability to conduct long-range aerial surveillance. In this aspect, India's plan is to gather as much intel as possible to keep China in check and allow for a fast deployment if things begin to escalate. One example of this is the procurement and increased use of the Boeing P-8I, which has been flown out of Port Blair to conduct anti-submarine surveillance in the surrounding waters. This not only acts as a deterrent, but if it comes down to it, the P-8I could destroy an enemy vessel if needed. This transitions us into the second reason why runways are being built and extended on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. These new extended airfields are being built for national defense as well. Like the naval presence around the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, having aircraft will greatly strengthen India's strategic capabilities in the surrounding area. India currently has hundreds of Soviet-era fighters that can still be deadly if used properly. These aircraft include the Sukhoi Su-30 and the MiG-21s. However, it's the much more modern Hal Tejas designed and constructed by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited that could pose a real threat to Chinese forces operating in the region. Having the ability to mount a naval and aerial defense will be vital to the future if India needs to protect the entrance to the Andaman Sea, Bay of Bengal, or waters of the Indian Ocean. Most of the naval vessels currently stationed at the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are patrol boats and frontline warships. India is not trying to create a conflict, but it knows that the nation needs to be ready if China does become more aggressive. The more intel they have on what's going on in the waters they control, the better their forces will be able to react to hostilities. And although there are no current plans to build submarine bases on the islands, this might change in the future. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has implemented aggressive plans to update and improve India's infrastructure while earmarking around $750 million to also improve the capabilities of the Andaman and Nicobar Command, the only tri-service theater command in the Indian Armed Forces. What all this means is that India is taking the Chinese threat very seriously. They are actively dedicating money and resources to plans to disrupt Chinese expansion into the Indian Ocean. The stronger Indian forces become on and around the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, the more difficult it'll be for China to gain control of the waters of South Asia. China wants to become the sole dominant power in the region, and right now India is one of the main obstacles standing in their way. But things aren't going perfectly for India either. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands may be one of the most important island chains in the region, but maintaining infrastructure there can be incredibly difficult for a variety of reasons. One challenge the Indian government has faced has come from environmentalists who want to protect the islands from development. For several years, the military wanted to construct a radar station on Narkondam Island. It's here that the endangered species of bird called the Narkondam Island Hornbill lives. For years, the environmentalists successfully pleaded their case and ensured the hornbill's habitat was protected. However, when Prime Minister Modi was elected, he dismissed the concerns and ordered the radar station built anyway. A similar scenario unfolded on the Cocoa Islands, where even though environmentalists advocated for the protection of the island's habitat, new radar stations were built anyway to allow India to keep an eye on Chinese military bases in Myanmar. Of the 572 islands in the Andaman and Nicobar chain, only 37 are inhabited. This has led to many of the uninhabited islands being used for narcotic smuggling and unsanctioned stopping points for foreign boats. The hundreds of uninhabited islands could pose a threat to the military assets that India set up in the region and the nation's security. This has become such a major concern for military strategists that they've suggested the government encourage people to relocate to the uninhabited islands to help track vessels and deter illegal activity. And even though the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are extremely important, the Indian government has dragged its feet in terms of infrastructure development. It's reported that an undersea cable link between the mainland and the islands has remained unfinished for years, and that internet connectivity, even at the naval base at Port Blair, is spotty at best. The islands also experience intense weather annually, with cyclones sweeping across the region. These storms have caused damage to roads, bridges, and airfields, many of which are never repaired. 
heavy rains for six months out of the year, stall construction projects, and the distance between the islands and the mainland means it's expensive to ship the materials needed to build and repair infrastructure. And the military is certainly not immune to these problems. Even though India is rapidly trying to ramp up the number of ships, aircraft, and soldiers on the islands, there are a lot of barriers standing in the way. China's most likely been keeping a close eye on the situation in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and knowing just how vital the location is, the struggle to militarize the islands has given China hope. It's very likely that China does not want to go to war with India. No matter who won, an all-out war between the two nations would be catastrophic. Therefore, China is happy to continue using gray zone tactics and its economic and naval power to extend its influence in the region. Even though there's still a long way to go for India to properly fortify their position in the region, eventually the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will play a significant role in controlling the shipping lanes and waterways between the South China Sea and the Andaman Sea. This is a terrifying thought for China, as they do not want anything restricting the movements of their trade and military vessels. There is little doubt that China will continue to extend its power and influence throughout East and Southeast Asia. India's plans for the Andaman and Nicobar Islands may be the only thing standing in their way. Now watch India's World War III plan, or check out India vs China Who Would Win Army Military Comparison.